today on Doomed. Looks like we're going to have to call on poor Jonah Hill to do some more hard work for us because there's apparently uh, a lot more people he's going to have to bring out of fascism with (laughs) his line of hit comedy films. On today's episode of Doomed with Matt Binder, we will be talking about Nick Fuentes' Alt CPAC event from earlier this month, and this new sort of Christian futurism rebranding he's pushing forward with. We'll get into exactly what that means on this episode. And let me pull us up on the screen for people watching the live stream. And he is uh, laughing in my ear, which is causing me to laugh because it is. We're, we're going to talk about this too, Rab Top, obviously. But joining me on the show, it is a pleasure to welcome back Devin Burghardt. He is the executive director of IREHR, the Institute for Research and Education on Human Rights. Devin, it's always a pleasure to have you on this show, and uh, welcome to this episode. Hey, man, it's so great to be here. Thanks for having me back. Oh, thank you for coming on. Um, Before we get into the bulk of what this episode is going to be on, uh, I I feel like we do need to touch on this uh, because it is it is the current event portion. You know, the the, the news peg that brings this into what's happening right now at this very moment. And and just a few days ago, Kanye West, and I'm going to throw this up on the 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 screenshot of the Instagram post from Kanye West on the live stream. Just a few uh, days ago, Kanye West, who was going on an anti-Semitic tear just a few months ago, um, basically uh, aligning himself with far-right figures like Milo Yiannopoulos, uh, straight up uh, 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 white nationalists, although I'm sure you could argue the same for Milo, but uh, uh, more openly uh, embracing the white nationalist name, uh, Nick Fuentes, uh, going on Alex Jones' show and even uh, going so far that uh, Alex Jones felt the need to uh, publicly act surprised about some of the things Kanye West was saying, um, such as, I love Hitler, which is by far one of the funniest pronunciations of a sentence I've ever heard in my life. People should seek out that clip if you already haven't seen it. Um, after doing all this... Uh, Kanye has come out and said that uh, he saw 21 Jump Street starring Jonah Hill and it made him like Jewish people again. Uh, And I quote, uh, no one should take anger against one or two individuals and transform that into hatred towards millions of innocent people. No Christian can be labeled anti-Semite knowing Jesus is a Jew. Thank you, Jonah Hill. (laughs) I love you. Um... Really uh, amazing stuff, amazing stuff, and I feel bad for Jonah Hill because the pressure's now on. I mean, I mean, not only uh, does Jonah Hill have to now uh, take a huge responsibility going forward, um, but a lot of weight will also be carried on his shoulders if we ever discover a time machine. I assume. I mean, imagine only if uh, Hitler saw 21 Jump Street. Uh, (laughs) Maybe it would have taken Hot Tub Time Machine. I don't know. Christ. I mean, what do we do with this? I mean, there's nothing to do with it really uh, at this point, but to to honestly laugh because we need to just enjoy the few moments that we have of something like that. Um, Because then we get into the stuff we're going to talk about for the bulk of this episode. And it's it's like you know it's 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 it, it could get it could get uh depressing honestly I mean yeah um I mean not to say that Kanye West turn wasn't depressing uh but uh this small uh, portion of this storyline that is Kanye <laughs> West uh, was uh, I think uh, something to uh, <laughs> have fun with um, that was incredible yeah absolutely. So it's so Devin. Let's let's actually now turn to and you've come on this show before to talk about. I feel like 
you you have come on you definitely have come on this show before to actually bring us updates about whenever uh Nick Fuentes holds his alternative C pack. Um he usually does it literally the same time as the conservative uh whatever action conference. I don't remember what it stands for anymore. <laughs> I will say though, now I haven't attended in a couple of years, but there were a, a few years I attended, and I will say that if you've never gone to a CPAC before, um, it is an illuminating experience. Um, it, it it very much is like Comic Con for right wingers, and I don't just mean that in the sense that it's a conference and there are panels. I mean this in the sense of. You walk around Comic Con and you see some of the most insane, crazy shit, along with some real weirdos, and that's exactly the CPAC thing. It is amazing to to just experience at least once, and 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 uh, um, you know, and Nick Fuentes uses the event, knowing that there'll be these conservatives all gathered in one place to. Um, you know, try to send them across the street or across the neighborhood, whatever he had it this year, uh, to get them into a more extreme version of what CPAC is. And, and you better believe that, you know, CPAC's already really far out there. So you can only imagine what a Nick Fuentes uh, alt CPAC looks like. Well, yeah, I mean, this year in particular, with CPAC attendance being down so much and it being kind of a more abundant affair, in the you know light of the last couple of years in mainstream conservatism, um, the stark contrast between you know Fuentes's efforts to try to infiltrate what's left of CPAC and what he was doing across the street at the Marriott was really quite a stark um, stark vision for where kind of things were headed, you know. And it's a reminder that when Fuentes started doing his stuff, right where he became notorious was trying to act as kind of a rear guard rump action to peel away people from uh, Turning Points USA and their kind of efforts to kind of um, attack them for not being racist enough and not being, you know, anti-Semitic enough and using that as a way to both gain new recruits and to kind of pull them in a rightward direction. So to see him now in this space where he's got a, now a following of several hundred young white men showing up at his event across the street to take on a, a clearly, you know, openly um, fascistic position was uh, a stark contrast to where he started when he was, you know, trying to do the America first shtick and trying to, you know, take a more mainstream mainstreaming position now to see him with the you know mask off if you will to start pushing the you know a much more openly anti-semitic and white nationalist position was i, I think a reminder of where things have mo moved over the past three or four years right no i know this isn't the the the, the main issue of the show but i i did notice that cpac attendance seemed to to be like you mentioned seemed to be down this year more so than you know usual i mean i know there obviously was the 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 sort of influx of of uh attendees during the trump years uh especially during that those early years especially during like the the republican primary in 2016 i that was i attended that one and that was packed um and certainly it is dwindled but but i feel like um post 2020 like post when the f first year of the pandemic started, when CPAC came back, I feel like their attendance has been very much so down since then, which is interesting when you consider that the CPAC audience ostensibly is online talking about how uh, COVID isn't real and there's no reason to be afraid to attend uh, big packed events. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, you know, this year, I think in particular, there were a couple of things that led to the decline. I think the biggest one was that um, now Turning Points USA is, is now holding their own big events. You know, they held a big um, event in December in Phoenix um, that had several thousand people at it. Right. So in the past, you know, the 
the number of far right young people at these events was pretty big. Right? It was kind of a networking opportunity for, you know, young far right activists to get together at CPAC. A lot of that energy was taken away by TPUSA, who moved it off to, a, you know, a new direction. I think also switching back from, uh, you know, from to D.C., from Orlando was also a thing that kind of drew folks away. I think people were enjoying having that time in the sun as opposed to going back to D.C. in March. Um, and then I think that also you're right that there's there's something about what's going on inside the inside movement circles that is less interested in the moment on political questions and the kind of policy discussions about listening to another speech by Marjorie Taylor Greene or Ted Cruz. And instead, it's really about wanting to do the kind of cultural activism that's going on, whether it's, you know, attacking trans folks or banning books or taking over school boards. That stuff is far more interesting, I think, to the activist base today than it is what's going on inside the halls of CPAC. Right. You know, they should probably just start Although I guess you can argue that Turning Point USA is attempting to do this, they should actually just start like a legit conservative Comic Con. That would probably bring out the <laughs> like a, a celebration Ooh. of of the conservative takes on culture and movies and film and comic books and art. I mean, they're so obsessed with the uh, with uh, you know uh, they Disney casting a, a, a Black Little Mermaid. Then honestly. Anything that they're talking about uh, regarding conservative policy at CPAC, like uh, gone are the days when um, uh, what's his face? Um, Grover Norquist was a CPAC <laughs> all star talking about yeah. uh, lowering taxes. Right. I mean, could you imagine if they, they did that, though? You know, the star power under one roof, you'd have Kevin Sorbo and, you know, uh, Scott Bayo and uh, Lee Greenwood all in one place. I think that would be too much for them to take. Right. right. I don't forget the uh, the Star Wars uh, uh, star, Gina Carino. Who... Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> or Carano. Yeah, that's true. There are a bunch of anti-vaxxer types now who would, would be welcome. Um, right. So, yeah, it is a little bit of a different ballgame. Right, right. Um, yeah, I mean, it is, it, it's so, so how it well attended actually with all that in mind, how, it, you know, obviously Nick Fuentes would peel off, uh, just a portion of the CPAC attendees, but I'm assuming that in CPAC is sparsely attended. Then in turn, the, uh, what, what is his thing called again? The America first, what is it called again? Political action conference. Yeah. AFPAC. America Got it. This time it wasn't. I mean, and this ah. is a sign that he's pivoting to something new. Right. This time it was just called the Fuentes Rally. Right. It the was Fuentes Rally doesn't quite yeah. roll off the tongue, I guess. I don't know. I know. It, uh. it doesn't have the same kind of appeal, but it was all about him at this point. And it was all about the the pivot that he was going to do to Christian futurism, as he called it. Um I think by and large, he's throwing off the you know, the trappings of the kind of America first Trump style MAGA politics that he was using to cloak his national socialism and has now embraced a more openly aesthetic cultural version of those kind of political ideas, um, you know, and part of what's happened during his time hanging out with Yi was that I think he's embraced the politics and the, the importance of culture as a way to disseminate some of those ideas. So he's focused. He, while I won't give him all the credit, you know, because I think he's stealing from a lot of different places, um, you know, I think he's trying to craft a new, you know, culturally focused aesthetic version of fascism and trying to make it cool for folks. Um, that is where he's at. I think he's ridden the, the America first stuff as far as it's going to want to, as he, it, he can take it. And is now, he's now used ye to make that step to, you know, the next phase of his fascist career. Right. Right. And you know, nothing, nothing drips cool like Nick Fuentes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah who who is in a the... pair of ray-bans and wearing his you know his yeezy by gap uh sweater right so who, who was the big you know usually maybe it was different because the fuentes rally isn't the same as fpac 
But was there right. was there a big uh, Republican star at, at the Fuentes rally? Or was this just all about Nick Fuentes? It was much? all about Fuentes, right? It, they, it, they didn't have any additional speakers, didn't have an opening act. It was all um, Fuentes in front of a screen with that weird iconography, you know, the you know the grayish white background with the the crosses and the you know the um, nuclear destruction sequence from Twin Peaks kind of superimposed behind him to give him some kind of uh, you know some kind of stature um, while he's standing there in his in his Yeezy jacket with a pair of Ray Bans on. That was it. That's the the entire event. And people attended this live, right? Several hundred, yeah. Did he send his groipers out to CPAC as usual to try to burn, to try to to corral people over, or was there like a groiper invasion at CPAC this a year? A couple as well? of times, they, they went over a couple of times trying to get in, and you know were rebuffed. You know, as is its tradition now. It's more, you know, it's more um, theater than it is anything serious. You know, it's almost like uh, it's, it's almost like well, we're here, we have to do it. So, <laughs> right, right, you know. So, so I do have – you shared a, a clip from this Fuentes rally, and I do think people should see it, not because I like sharing Nick Fuentes' clips, but I should mention this isn't like I, – I, what was interesting to me, and I said this to you right before we, we, we went on air, is that I haven't seen very many people discuss this Fuentes rally, and even more so, I haven't seen anyone really discuss the content of – what Fuentes was saying, and and the reason I brought you on this show was because I thought this, your your background and look that you just put on Twitter, which I'm sure is just a small portion of of what we're going to talk about, uh, into futurism and Christian and and uh, Fuentes's rebranding of Christian futurism was very interesting to me because it's an area that yeah, I was not familiar with, and and you know in this in this area. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I don't know everything, but you know, being in this world for so long, I felt like, you know, that I, I'm aware of, uh, at least, uh, at, at a surface level, I've heard of most, uh, you know, things in this, this, uh, you know, this realm. Uh, but I was not very, uh, informed about about this area of it and so i really felt like i needed to tell other you know have you come on to tell other people about it and cool. the reason i want to show this video clip is again not because i want to share fuentes but because the aesthetic is very much part of the whole thing absolutely right that is a key element of this yeah right so i'm gonna play a very short clip of uh that that uh actually uh devin uh shared on his twitter of um fuentes from his rally Right now, I don't know if you're going to hear it on your end, but it's only like a minute long, if not even, and I'm probably not going to play it all. I'll let you know when cool. it's over if you don't hear it. Yeah, right on. What you find is that 70 or 80 years ago, there was a serious transformation of our elite. For a 1, thousand, 1,500 years, Western civilization was led by Christian monarchs. Since the first millennium, European Western civilization was run by Christians and by strong Christian leaders. And a century ago, there were still strong Christian leaders in Europe, and we know what happened to them. It was the monarchies in Russia, it was the monarchy in Germany, in other countries. And what happened? All of them fell in the war. And what came out after World War II was a completely different kind of system a truly liberal, democratic, international system. And it was led in large part by people who are Jewish and some atheists and other kinds of people. And so the simple question is, is this, can you fundamentally change the elite of a country and have the same country? Can you do that? No! All right, so... <laughs> Let's let's now that we saw this bizarre image. I mean, I feel like I'm watching a, I don't know, like a a, a David Cronenberg uh, <laughs> movie or something. Um, very bizarre, um, with the crosses flying behind him and his outfit, and even the framing of him at the, uh, you know, the the lower like like his body just feels like the lower third where we can see the lower thirds yeah, of the yeah, screen. Yeah. 
just very bizarre. Um, so, so let's jump into this uh, futurism uh, uh, rebrand from Fuente. So, so, so start us all off here. What exactly is futurism? Well, you know, if you ask Nick Fuentes, I don't think he'd be able to tell you. I think he's really, you know, trying to graft onto it a lot of different things. But in its classical sense, you know, Italian futurism emerged really in the first decade of the 20th century, really as kind of an avant-garde artistic movement um, that fused that fuse politics and art. Um, what really is important to note about it is it grew up alongside and was really important to the development of Italian fascism. As the historian Stanley Payne notes in his, uh, you know, his work on fascism, um, the founding of uh, Italian futurism in 1909 really laid the groundwork for fascism a decade later, and it really was an important part of it. Um, you know, it really is part of that ideological origin uh, and the vehicle through which um, Mussolini and the fascist regime, regime gained popularity in the mainstream in Italy during the period. Um, you know, one of its founders was a guy named F.T. Uh, Martinetti, and he was really known for um, both the artistic side of it in terms of his work. Uh, with poetry as well as promoting a lot of artists who and sculptors who used a futuristic style to glorify the importance of Italian nationalism. And the kind of ultra nationalism is really a key element of this, right? It was um, the glue which bound together this new artistic form with, you know, Italian nationalism, something um, that really didn't exist in a form prior to it and became so important for the kind of formation of Italian nationalism that gave the kind of foothold for uh, what would become fascism of, uh, several years later. I think the other important thing to note about it and what Martinetti was really um, so strongly promoting in, in his work um, was the kind of glorification of war. You know, he wrote that um, we will glorify war, the world's only hygiene, militarism, patriotism, the destructive gesture of freedom bringers and beautiful ideas worth dying for. You know, Martin Eddy and the Futurists were really responsible for the idea of war as a kind of cleansing action um, to bring that kind of panjuric form of populist ultranationalism that would emerge out of the ashes. So that kind of imperialistic, nationalistic, militaristic idea was being expressed even before fascism in art and became, you know, a really important component of of that. And so the aesthetics and the um, notions around war really fused together and became that driving force um, that merged together a few years later once Martinetti and Mussolini got to know one another uh, and began to form a bond. And in fact, Martinetti eventually um, Martin Martinetti folded his futurist political party and merged it into um, Mussolini's fascist party and became really um, no longer an avant-garde, but really became a mouthpiece for the fascist regime under Mussolini and really played that important role of um, you know, promoting those values of speed, danger, fearlessness, aggression, and what they called the punch and the slap necessary for a new age of Italian grandeur, uh, if you will. So those are the kind of ideas that were being promoted by the futurists, um, you know, and that's what you see the aesthetic and the kind of uh, in some of the other clips I put on Twitter, you know, in terms of the you, you see this immense destruction and nu a nuclear holocaust going on behind Fuentes as he's delivering this speech where he's talking about how much he loves Hitler um, is a reminder of the importance of that iconography and the imagery and the promotion of war as that cleansing element, which I think is going to be something we're going to hear more about from these folks moving on down the road. That makes sense. Right. Absolutely. Right. I mean, I feel like I mean, obviously, at its core, like art has always had a connection with politics as a whole, obviously. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's not surprising, I guess, that 
um, in modern, you know, we even we see it very clearly. Obviously, we were just talking before about uh, the right wing's absolute obsession right now with the culture wars over everything else. Policy, the usual, even conservative policy, shit out the window, and it's just obsession over um, movies and 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 uh, uh, live shows right now. When it comes to drag queens, any sort of uh, expression, artistic expression that they find to uh, not fit their own personal moral standards or whatever. Yeah. Um, so it's not surprising, I guess. I mean, even even Fuentes himself with the the old groiper image. Uh, um, I, I mean, I guess they still use it, that weird, uh, big, bloated frog that's not quite Pepe um, that – has become the symbol for groipers. Uh, but, you know, I, the the aesthetic he's going with now seems to sort of, I don't know, it almost feels like this could have been a, a, a like his rally could have been a Kanye West video, honestly. Like, uh, like uh, as you describe this, like, sort of, you know, the, 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 the um, and it makes a lot of sense, too, because as you've been describing this, the, the sort of uh, uh, Italian, um, sort of uh, beginnings or origins or roots of this sort of uh, futurist uh, movement. I mean, I'm not saying Kanye was straight up always influenced by uh, Italian fascists, but Kanye's a big fan of uh, you know European design, and he's I'm sure specifically name dropped the various different big Italian designers too, who I'm sure. So I'm, sh I'm sure even a lot of them themselves uh, t have uh, their founding ties rooted in, you know, uh, 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 the early, uh, you know, fascist Italy days of Mussolini and such. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of that um, time spent with Yi that I think is rubbed off and shown in the presentation at the Fuentes rally there. Um, you know, it is in a lot of ways like a, you know, like a music video with no performance other than his, other than his speech. And so I think that I think while Fuentes has always been concerned about optics, uh, you know, he's taken it now in a different direction, right? Before it was all trying to be, um, you know, to simultaneously appeal to the normies in the MAGA crowd and also appeal to the Groypers, right? He was able to walk that line. Now I think he's trying to instead appeal to the Groypers on the one hand and bring them along and to promote this new kind of aesthetic and see what kind of new crowds that can bring and what kind of new um, directions he can take that. You know, I think what was also important to note really as far as where Fuentes is and where this could go um, there are a couple other things that it, that Italian futurism had as kind of you know commonalities for what Fuentes has been doing for a long time um, the other thing that Italian futurism was known for was expressive terrorism or Turismo expressivo um, you know which was the kind of promotion of genocidal and terroristic fantasies, you know, whether it be, you know, a lot of back then it was fantasies about suicide bombers. Um, you know, Martin Eddy once wrote about um, a glorification of the 20 year youth who hold, who throws the bomb, you know, so it was a kind of idea of that kind of acts of individual terror, which we're, I think we're seeing an uptick in right now, particularly when it comes to issues around anti-Semitism and around race. <laughs> Um, and also that kind of plays out in their attacks on political opponents. You know, back then, Martin Eddy led a group of uh, other supporters to attack a socialist newspaper, you know, and burn the building to the ground. Um, so I think that also is something else, you know, that the far right in general has appealed to, you know, back in the, you know, back three or four years ago, that was the terrain of the Proud Boys and whether or not that means that, you um, Fuentes is trying to capture some of that energy and move in that more explicitly warlike terroristic direction. Too soon to be told, um, but you know that's certainly where what Italian futurism foretold. Um, 
And the other thing that, you know, has always irritated me a lot about Fuentes uh, and is something he shares with uh, the Italian futurists is that um, ironical dimension to them. You know, the way he can say, oh, this, this is just a joke, you know, I'll just play off his, you know, horrifically bigoted genocidal fantasies and anti-Semitic comments. You know, the futurists were really playful and, per, um, you know, and use parody a lot and, and um they also shared stylistically a lot with Fuentes in terms of a style that was aristocratic um, or similar to that of the kind of middle, middle class intellectuals of the day. So it had some of the same kind of, you know, aesthetics that, you know, Fuentes has played around with. So in a lot of ways, it's a really good fit for him. Where it isn't, though, is the kind of glomming onto the Christian side of it all and his, you know, his presenting himself as a, you know, kind of traditionalist in a lot of ways, which he's done over the past few years. Um, those two things don't really work hand in hand. In right. fact, the futurist clashed a lot with, uh, you know, the Roman Catholic Church during the period. Um, and, you know, the futurists were really modernist. They were focused on the, the importance of technology and industry and driving forward a kind of new future for of Italian grandeur. They weren't backwards looking and, you know, the glorifying of tradition and, and the past. So that was really, you know, that I think is a hard thing for him to square in terms of this notion. You know, in the course of his speech, he didn't try to do that. And in fact, he really only gave lip service to the notion of Christian futurism. But, you know, he was clearly using those dog whistles as a kind of signal to the kind of stuff that um, the futurist talked about. And, you know, and given that even prior to Fuentes using that term, that there were, a, you know, there were a couple different telegram groups that, that have popped up in the last couple of years that have promoted the kind of futurism ideas. Uh, and it's been circulating in the kind of circles where Fuentes spends a lot of his time. It's not entirely surprising to see it popping up, you know, and seeing promoting some of this. In a lot of ways, it reminds me back in like in the 90s when you know, National Socialists, a bunch of them tried to adopt, um, you know, tried to adopt third positionism as a way to, you know, look to a kind of, you know, to to be able to make a lot of the same racist and anti-Semitic genocidal arguments that outright National Socialists were doing, but have a slightly off kilter branding so they wouldn't couldn't necessarily get pegged with it. And they could, you know, they could graft onto it some pro environmental messages or some pro union messages or, you know, kind of have a tilt to the left for a nanosecond. Um, so in some respects, it, it has some of those feelings when he's using it this way. But I think it does indicate that for a section of the white nationalist movement, it has definitely entered a new period. You know, we've moved beyond a period where um, their ability to move so quietly and deftly into the mainstream has ended. And so now they've got to find some new avenues to try to gain new recruits to advance their message and to move fascism forward. Um, and I think that, you know, they've realized, particularly after what Fuentes and his crowd went through after January 6th, um, that they've got to, you know, that they've got to adapt a little bit. And this is very much what we're seeing here. You know, if you recall, Fuentes was one of the folks who got subpoenaed by the January 6th committee because he was so influential. He, along with Alex Jones and Ali Alexander, were kind of the, you know, the big triumvirate driving those stop to steal rallies around the country, getting people out and mobilizing people to, you know, to try to, you know, keep alive the nonsense notion that the election was stolen. Um, you know, and as a result of that, in, in addition to being on the Capitol grounds, the day of the insurrection was, uh, you know, ended up getting subpoenaed for it. And as a result, the aftermath of that led to, you know, um, a split in his organization where Patrick Casey left the group. You know, he was the head of the Identity Europa beforehand and, you know, the American Identity Movement, who is really kind of the key organizer for the group. He left it. You know, a few years late, you know, a few months later, he lost, you know, a couple of his key lieutenants, you know, Jaden McNeil, uh, you know, the Kansas State Groiper who joined up with him. And then his his web designer bailed after a lot of pressure uh, internally and some, you know, those personal fights about the, you know, about the use of the blacklight and whatnot, which I think we talked about before. Right. Um, 
Yeah. So, I mean, there's, a, you know, there's all this kind of stuff going on <laughs> within started. his movements, um, <laughs> you know, and then, you know, thanks to his connections with Milo and then, the, you know, the connections with, with Yi, suddenly he's, you know, he's cast into a different stratosphere. You know, he's flying around on private jets all of a sudden and, uh, you know, and being able to talk on, you know, the bigger platforms on the far right, whether it be, you know, Alex Jones or, uh, you know, Tim Pool, all of those feet, those folks were suddenly giving him a platform that he wasn't allowed to have before. So um, I think he's he's a smart enough guy to, to learn from those things. And, you know, he's always going to be looking for that next big opportunity to cast him, you know, to to gain a big platform. And that's a challenge for those of us who are who are are watching him because, you know, you never know which way he's going to feign. You know, it could be, you know, the next thing you'll see him, you know, I don't know, wearing a clown suit and, you know, and jumping around on stage. I I'm, I don't know, you know, but it's it's something, you know, to understand that he is clearly um, taking the mask off and is not even pretending anymore to be, um, you know, st staying clear of the white nationalist stuff. And and is also being the most vocal promoter of the most vicious anti-Semitism we've seen in a long time, you know, even from folks in the white nationalist movement, you know, the fact that he's so open and and vocal about it and as making it the centerpiece of his platform means that that really the, that first period of white nationalism, which was defined from really 1994, really until now, um, is dead, right? The idea that, um, you know, that you should downplay your anti-Semitism and lift up racism as the key avenue to move into the mainstream, you know, the kind of Jared Taylor American Renaissance version of white nationalism that's dead for this new gener generation because of folks like Nick Fuentes and they've really um, focused on anti-Semitism as that driving factor. And there are, I mean, there are lots of reasons for that, but I think that's something worth noting. Right. Right. And, you know, as you mentioned too, and I was, um, you know, I was watching um, part of the Fuentes rally and this isn't again, not surprising from him because other people within the even broader conservative movement have been doing the same thing. But those uh, events over the past couple of years that conservatives, right wingers, and even white supremacists and far right, uh, uh, people have been even backing away from like Charlottesville. He's just like, openly embracing now now i don't recall if fuentes ever backed off of uh you know his role there like others did um but he he seems to be just uh uh again in sort of a broader trend too with other guys but they're like full like you know right after january 6 for example the the thing on the right was uh those weren't real uh, you know, uh, Trump supporters. Now they are heroic political prisoners who were happily let in by uh, the deep state and the FBI informants and the undercover police. Uh, and and they everyone at January sixth was the good guys now. Apparently, um, that seems to be a, a a trend too that Fuentes, I guess, is is also just glomming onto. Yeah, I mean, it was interesting to see him, you know, at the Fuentes rally, both, um, you know, both kind of lift up his role in Charlottesville, um, you know, lift up his role with January 6th and, you know, now talk about his, you know, the f future direction in, w in which he's taking things. I think that is a uh, rather than in the past where he's tried to downplay them. Now he's just like, yeah, he's just masked off, just uh, as open a as can be about it and saying, yeah, this is part of our political project, you know, uh, like it or not, this is what we're doing and we're going to make that happen. He's, you know, he's clearly backed off of any suggestion of trying to be mainstream at all. And it's now very much just adopted the, you know, this new political program. Although, you know, when you listen to him on a daily basis, um, you know, you're still hearing a lot of the same kind of nonsense, right? It's still, um, you know, the everyday um, 
issues of the day, which he'll go through and grind through. And, you know, I was listening to him before we came on to see how he was talking about the, you know, the, the shooting in, in Tennessee. And of course, you know, he's talking about how trans people shouldn't have guns and how, you know, they have problems and, you know, and that kind of stuff. So he's, um, you know, he's he's already on to he was already last night on to the kind of anti trans messaging coming out of that. He is adept at, you know, glomming on to the issues and moments of the day and always spinning them in a more bigoted, nationalistic, you know, genocidal direction, which is why it makes him so dangerous to have, be having the platform that he does. Right. I mean. When it comes to the uh, anti-trends crusade from the right right now, I mean, uh, I'm sure Fuentes' language might be a little bit uh, more extreme, but the sentiment is certainly um, almost verbatim, if if not actually yeah. verbatim, to even mainstream conservative figures. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I that's mean, an issue where he's he's following, not leading. Right, right. Which probably why he hasn't uh, sort of uh, centered it in his focus. Right. Because uh, I guess when it comes to uh, anti-Semitism, uh, no one can touch Nick Fuentes quite yet. Yeah, I mean, outside of somebody like Kevin McDonald, you know, the you know who's written a half a dozen books on the subject, you know, for the Zoomers, there's nobody like out there doing the same kind of thing for anti-Semitism that Nick Fuentes is doing. Right. And when I was reading through your, um, you know, your your breakdown of this online, um, you know, one of the things I, I noticed you mentioned, and it's it seems very sort of, um, uh, you know, sort of. Obvious, and you touched upon it too with how it was he was different from the futurists um, and their sort of embrace of technology, and they weren't espousing like traditionalist views like uh, Fuentes does with, uh, I guess, his brand of Christian futurism. But also, I, what struck me was it doesn't even align with, uh, and not just this event either, just his. His pre presentation of it, I guess, because the message, I guess, does. But the presentation doesn't align with the usual sort of patriotic, real American conservatism type thing. Like, aesthetic-wise, you would, you know, no American flags, no eagles flying across the sky, no American soldiers, like, trotting down, like, no, uh, uh, you know... Uh, weird usual sort of old school christian classic like a uh, patriotic bullshit that they usually you know uh you know fill their events and rallies and messaging with it's a complete break from the you know libertarian tea party-esque style politics that, that have been dominant for the last decade right it is a complete severing of that you know when you think about you know a kind of pro-war pro-imperialist you know pro-nazi-esque party you know you're talking about something which is very much different than the kind of libertarian-esque branding that's wrapped in the constitution that you know so much of the maga movement was based around and grew up out of so in that respect yeah it's a complete break from what so much of the mainstream of the far right has been up to for the last decade plus. Um, and it does potentially, uh, you know, indicate perhaps a turn to something new, or it could just be a fad and, you know, he's going to move on to, you know, whatever next. We're not sure yet. Right. Do we know what his current, because, because, you know, sticking back to this, because it really is like, I feel like you could put uh, a Kanye video and this rally side by side and it's it's visually the influence Kanye has had on Fuentes uh, aesthetically is probably equal to the uh, influence Fuentes has had on Kanye ideologically. Um, yeah. Do we know what Kanye's current status with Fuentes is? They haven't done any events lately together. I don't know if... Uh, uh, Fuentes has commented on Kanye's recent awakening via uh, 21 Jump Street starring Jonah Hill. Do I have not heard him comment on that. Um, you know, there had been 
some rumors that he was on the outs with Kanye, uh, with Kanye, um, you know, going through some more stuff out in California. Uh, Fuentes actually left there to go to do some podcast in the UK before heading to the event in uh, DC. Um, and so I, there ha- doesn't appear to have been a lot of connection with them since and uh, whether or not this is a you know a short uh, hopefully a short term you know a, a short term relationship because um, the the mainstreaming of anti-Semitism that was a result of the just you know the few appearances that they had together I think was significant and real uh, you know and and we're going to be living with you know kind of I think in terms of the composition of the far right for a long time in terms of their ability to get away with it and it's, you know, driving force. Um, and I think that also gets back to part of the reason why, um, you know, Fuentes has been so successful with it and why I think he feels it's okay to do it now. Um, is that, you know, particularly during the pandemic, the advancement of conspiratorial thinking, um, all grounded in those kind of, you know, base anti-Semitic tropes, um, you know, became so much more mainstream. You know, the, you know, the classic anti-Semitic tropes about blood libel and, you know, the, you know, the stuff about drinking babies' blood and all of that stuff that became popularized with QAnon and the various different forms of that stuff. Um, throughout the pandemic, you know, and throughout the past four years, um, really helped, um, shape the thinking of a lot of new people, new entries into the far right. And as a result of that, there are far more people who are much more, um, open to that kind of, you know, that kind of thinking. And so Fuentes can easily fit into that, into that space and kind of take over and be the most, um, you know the ones who one who's pushing that edge the the most often and the, and the loudest you know and have him you know have a spokesperson like he out there doing that stuff is uh you know is really a um you know a a megaphone to which you know far rightists could have only dreamed of half a decade ago so i think that's all playing part of it right no absolutely um although i will say there's probably uh something funny about and i'm sure uh maybe there's video or people who are there covering this herd i'm also uh going to assume that a number of people who attended the fuentes rally uh had their fingers crossed they were going to actually if not the majority had their fingers crossed that they were actually going to get a glimpse of kanye west there. <laughs> they were actually in the hallway chanting his name thinking that really? there was going to be a possibility yeah before the event yeah and no. uh, Fuentes disappointed them, I'm assuming. Did, do we know if Fuentes – because I wouldn't put it past him to send his groupers out there with, like, flyers saying, come see the Secret of Kanye concert. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I don't think he pulled that one off. Uh, we didn't get any indication of that. But, you know, there was, there was the hope that they were going to have, you know – you know, an African-American guy, star up there, you know, giving them, you know, the lines of anti-Semitism and, and, you know, rolling out the kind of nonsense that he was. I mean, you know, if you watched either the, you know, if you watched, you know, Yi and and uh, Fuentes on, you know, Alex Jones or Tim Pool or, you know, Yi on um, Gavin McGinnis's show, it was all... Um, rambling, largely incoherent, um, but with a, a dash of, uh, theater and a, um, you know, occasional bits of comedy in it. Um, which I think is also part of that, you know, that little futurist thing is in terms of, you know, being able to use parody and jokes and irony as a way to promote your message was also, interestingly enough, part of that, you know, to see, you know, to see ye come out on the, on stage with Alex Jones wearing a, you know, a full face balaclava and do his net and yoo joke. Um, you know, those were things that were, um, you know, intentionally or unintentionally um, comical, but also, you know, also still driving the kind of 
different ways in which you can package your anti-Semitism to get it to a different audience and really drive home, you know, in the case, in that case, it was a lot of both uh, misogyny and anti-Semitism woven together. And, um, you know, and that really has been, I think, Fuentes' brand from the from the jump, right? It's been, for him, you cannot forget, um, you know, his the past several years, um, his focus on kind of driving misogyny and the kind of appeal to, you know, to far right incels as a way to, you know, gain support and combine that now with this anti with these anti this anti-Semitism, that's the kind of army he's trying to build. And that's, you know, that where he's trying to take the Groypers. Right, right. Well, one thing that stuck with me, and I still, it's still so ridiculous when I think about it or even see the clips of it is like, and this was especially obvious during the Alex Jones uh, appearance from Kanye and Fuentes, but how certain questions or certain things Alex Jones would bring up to Kanye and he would sort of look over to Fuentes like a, you know, like a, a student at school trying to cheat on a test, uh, going to like the kid who obviously knows the answer and like how it just seemed like, or, or when Kanye would say something, he would look over at Fuentes to double check that like, was that the line? Was that the correct sort yeah. of answer? And, and Fuentes, when hearing certain lines, would just ear to ear giant grin as if like, that's my boy. I taught him, you know, I taught him right or whatever. Very, yeah. it was very like, we, like very startling sort of back and forth behavior between those two. And I, the, like you said, the, the sooner that ends, uh, the better, honestly. Well, and that corollary was, um, the corollary was, um, Fuentes always just deferring to, to Yi and saying, I agree with Yi, right? All, every single time just being deferential and agreeing, agreeing with what he was saying, you know, that they they had this, um, back and forth that was really disturbing. You could see, um, both sides trying to, to play Alex Jones and watching him try to, um, you know, dance around that was, uh, I think the most interesting part of that dynamic is how they can get around, uh, you know, how Alex Jones could try to get, you know, get himself extricated from that situation where he found himself giving a platform to this, you know, these notorious anti-Semites was, uh, quite entertaining. Right. Right. Well, Devin, Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, always a pleasure to have you on. Oh, let me ask you. Is yeah. there anything um, you're, and I understand if you can't share yet, anything you're working on that we should keep an eye out uh, in terms of uh, research, uh, uh, events or movements on the right you're tracking? Anything you got in the works that uh, you could share? Yeah, we got a couple things coming up. Um you know, the first is we're going to do a, you know, kind of a deeper dive into this Christian futurism and, and what Fuentes is up to and kind of get a sense to where the Groypers are heading, you know, kind of to bookend that first report we did from alt-right to Groyper. Now look at from Groyper to Christian futurism. Um, the second thing we're, we've got in the works is a, a new look at the where the Ammon Bundy's People's Rights Network is at. You know, ah. post pandemic, you know, they're still up, you know, despite him being involved in a myriad of legal troubles, um, that organization is up to about 40,000 people nationally. So we're kind of keeping an eye on that. Uh, and then the third project we've got going on is um, it's our HR's 40th anniversary. So we're we got a couple of big events coming up to, you know, to kind of celebrate those things. We've got a, you know, a, an anthology of some of our work coming up. We've got a symposium we got planned for Seattle out here and then a big celebration in Kansas City to to mark 40 years of our work. So those are all well, things we got coming down the pike. Happy anniversary. Congrats. Yeah, thanks. Um, Feel free, Devin, let people know exactly where they can find you and your organization online, share links, whatever you'd like. Uh, go ahead. Right on. Yeah, you can uh, find us on Twitter. You can find me on Twitter at D Burghart, D-B-U-R-G-H-A-R-T, or at I-R-E-H-R on Twitter. You can also find us online on our website at IREHR.org. Devin Burghart, Institute for Research and Education on Human Rights, Thanks again. Always a pleasure to have you on this show and uh, talk to you again soon. Right on. Thanks, Matt. Take care. All right, folks. We got more show for you in just a moment. 
Um, I will be going to the second half of the show in just a minute where I will be taking calls. I will be reading your um, your super chats and your Twitch messages. Uh, I will be uh, doing all that fun stuff. Of course, you could call into Skype uh, in just a few. Just search Doomed Live on Skype. Doomed Live, one word. And uh, I take the calls as they come in. No screener, no screening the calls. Just your your name pops up as you call in. I take the call, and then it continues on. So until uh, I call it a night. But before we do that, before we do that, so don't call in just yet if you're watching live. Before we do that, I got some uh, things to talk about. If you'd like to support this show, if you can support this show, please go to Patreon dot com slash mapbinder and become a monthly paying subscriber um the end the beginning of the next month april is coming up at the end of this week uh patreon will of course start charging um the uh subscribers uh because that's how it works and we will inevitably uh lose people due to uh you know financial difficulties uh, credit card declines. It happens all the time. Cards even just expire. Um, and it's always rough for all Patreon uh, uh, creators at the beginning of the month. Uh, so if you can become a subscriber and help grow this show, I would greatly appreciate that. And to show you how much I appreciate that, I'm going to thank the people who signed up for Patreon uh, since the last episode of the show, we got Uncle Slayer, Bryce G, Tanya K, and then we also have two patrons who upped their subscription to support the show even more than they already do, Brian M and Matt S. Thank you all so much for your support. Uh, literally cannot do this show or my other show, Scam Economy, or any of the work I do without the support from my patrons. Patreon.com slash MattBinder if you can. Uh, and if you can't, you know, subscriptions, times are tough. I get it. If you'd like to just give a one-off payment, you could go to YouTube.com slash MattBinder and drop a super chat. And I will also read your super chat during the live stream show. Uh, the second half of the live stream show, I should say. Uh, so youtube.com slash Matt Binder. And while you're there, subscribe to the channel if you aren't already. Uh, you can also go to twitch.tv slash Matt Binder and follow that channel where I simulcast the live stream. But also, if you're an Amazon Prime subscriber already, if you connect your Amazon account to your Twitch account, Amazon gives you a free Twitch Prime subscription every month. That's basically a paid subscription to your favorite creator, paid for them, I should say. Not paid for you. It comes free with your Amazon Prime subscription. And uh, by not using it, you just let Jeff Bezos and uh, the Amazon execs Keep your extra money that you're already paying them. So give it to your favorite creator. And I'm telling you this because I'm hoping you'll give me that Twitch Prime subscription. Uh, but literally, even if you don't give it to me, just definitely use it on someone. Spread spread the love, spread the wealth to others. Uh, Amazon's got enough of your money already via that Twi that uh, Amazon Prime subscription. Of course, you go to doomedcast.com for the podcast version of the show, all the links to the Apple podcast version, the Spotify version, etc. While you're at those platforms, be sure to leave a review if you can. By leaving a review, you help push the show up the podcast charts and in turn help more people find out about the show. Uh, you could also check out my other show, Scam Economy at scameconomy.com. Also, be sure to uh, follow me on Twitter at Matt Binder. Um, search for me on any platform, Matt Binder. You'll find me there. Uh, I think that's everything I want to say right now, at the very least. And uh, 
uh, Daredevil is saying in the chat, Binder, you should record a pitch and play that while you take a break. True, but then I can't give you real time thank yous to my Patreon subscribers. And you know, while I'm while while I'm still here on this first half of the show, I'm gonna thank the um, Twitch Prime subscribers that just uh, signed up just now. That just came in. Uh, thank you, Kami Space Wizard, for subscribing via Prime just now on Twitch. And also, thank you to a social communist resubscribed for one month over on Twitch. They've been a subscriber for 13 months in a row on Twitch. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you to uh, Renee for dropping that super chat in the YouTube live stream just now, saying that uh, this is him on the uh, Fuentes video. It just looks as if Marine Le Pen joined Daft Punk. Uh, yeah, that's pretty spot on, actually. <laughs> oh, that's pretty good, Renee. Um, all right. Oh, and uh, oh, we just got uh, Butterbean subscribed for one month at Tier 1 over in Twitch as well. And Ponderosapine just, re just resubscribed for one month. Subscriber for 15 months in a row. Thank you so much, Ponderosapine. And they say, Matt, we need new emotes. Yeah, I got to set up emotes for the Twitch subscribers. I will figure that out. Eventually, I promise. I feel like an old man over on Twitch. Um, <laughs> all right, let's go to the second half of the show. If you are a Patreon subscriber, if you are watching the live broadcast on YouTube or Twitch, absolutely nothing changes for you. I will just take a quick break. You will listen to a quick musical interlude, um, and I will be right back here. The, the feed doesn't even change. If you listen to the freebie podcast version of this show, though, this is where I say to you, goodbye, and I will see you all next time on Doomed. Welcome to the second half of the live stream show. Uh, my name is Matt Binder. The phone lines... Well, first let me pull myself up on the feed. Here you go. Hello, everybody. It's me again. Um, the phone lines are now open. Search Doomed Live over on Skype. Uh, you could literally use Skype on any platform. You could download the Mac Windows app. You can uh, download the iOS or Android mobile app. You can also just go to the Skype website and uh, call in. And, uh, oh, we have some calls coming in right now. Hey, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Oh, turn the uh, the uh, live stream show down and uh, just listen to the uh, Skype call. Hello? Hey, you got to turn down the uh, live stream. Hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Crap. Oh, I, everything's good now. I don't hear the live stream. I just hear you right now. Hey, what's your name? Where are you calling from? This is my Bender. Hey, who's this? Listen up. You know who this is. 
you globalist, Soros back, Illuminati child sacrificing, sulfur like smelling, baby brain eating, skin mask wearing, child raping, Kazar Mafia, Cabal, <laughs> Adrenochrome drinking, lizard shape shifting, gay frog back licking, demonic, degenerate, socialist, satanic, evil, woke, leftist, liberal, Marxist, CRT, indoctrinated climate change cultists, Jesus Christ wins in the end, brother. Holy shit, I think I'm about to have a heart attack. Oh, where's my body and I'm making that? <laughs> I gotta say, this sounds like, uh, at moments, it sounded like uh, South Park's Eric Cartman doing an Alex Jones impression. <laughs> uh, other times, it sounded like uh, Hulk Hogan uh, <gasps> doing an Alex Jones impression. Uh, <laughs> it was a, it was a amazing. Uh, the the w- some of the things that you dropped, <laughs> I was uh, like, I whoa, know, man! <laughs> you just you just killed Alex Jones, and you're gonna burn in hell for an eternity, brother. <laughs> was that? Well, that that was the whole Kogan one right there. <laughs> Let me tell you something, brother. Damn, you're right, man. I didn't practice hard enough, I guess. No, it's. I mean, you you were on a roll there with just like the the things you were spitting out there. That was more than the like the the vocal impression. The actual content of what you were saying caught me for a loop. <laughs> that was the good stuff. That whoa, oh, you got Alex Jones down right there. <laughs> I don't know. Man. I don't know how he talks like that, man. That shit hurt my throat. <laughs> he does that shit all day long, man. I don't know how he does it. He must smoke like three packs of cowboys a day. I don't know. Hey, right. hey, Matt. Matt, did you see uh, Roseanne on Alex Jones' show? Roseanne went on Alex Jones' show? Yeah, I mean, you didn't see it. When was this? Was this a while oh, ago man. recently? Yeah, it was about a week or two ago. Oh, that's Dude. not a while ago. That's that's recent, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. Oh, um, it was insane, man. The stuff they were talking about. They were drinking from a I liquor mean, bottle. I mean, I, I'll be I'll be honest with you. Like, I usually don't really care about these right wingers who uh, these celebrities who become right wingers. I mean, none of them are usually any good or talented. Yeah, and I never thought that Roseanne was a good stand up comic either. Uh, but I will say that the original Roseanne sitcom uh, meant a lot to me. It meant a lot to me. Like, it was uh, her character isn't the best. By far, hers is not even close to being the best. John Goodman and um, uh, he was the best. Laurie Metcalf steal that show. I mean, the Which two of them are Laurie fantastic. Metcalf? Her, her, the Jackie, the sister. Okay, okay, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. To to me, the two of them were always the best in that show. But to see the 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 the, the, the title name character, the one who created the show, Roseanne, create what, in my opinion, was the um the one true to life depiction of a poor working class American family during on television during the nineties um, was, was meaningful to me as someone who uh, felt closer to that than any other, the families I saw on TV. Um, and uh, it, it sucks that she, she went this way. It really does. Yeah, man. Um, my sister used to love that sitcom, and it was a, it was pretty good, man. I watched it with her. It was like one of those uh, after school specials, sort of type. Like you know, it always had like a lesson in the end and everything. But man, it was wild, dude. I, she she starts off real crazy, and then they they pull out a bottle of liquor, and she's talking about how she's Jewish. But throughout the whole thing, she's talking about Jesus and Satan and hell and all these things that aren't Jewish. And it was on that Jewish holiday that was like two weeks ago. Oh, what is it? When they're not supposed to work. And she was on his show drinking and she she takes a pill halfway through it. Like she takes her medication and you see it. I don't know what it was, but she goes from being like real, real like like she normally is, you know, like yelling and screaming. And then she gets real calm. This is really, it's really weird. And then Alex Jones, after they bo- open that bottle up, he he pretends to cry, dude. It is so fake. Not even a single tear comes down his out down his face. He's like, I can't believe, you know, because he's talking about the deep state and how he's been fighting against them his entire life and how we're, we're you know, it was just, it was something else, dude. 
I, I, I guess I gotta check out some some clips of it at the very least, because uh, I mean, I saw Roseanne's. I think it was like on Daily Wire or some. She did some stand up yeah. special for some conservative outlet, uh-huh. and it was so bad. And I don't it mean was bad. Horrible. I don't just mean bad. Like, oh, I don't agree with the content. No, I mean just yeah. just basing it on funny. Like, listen. I've seen some comedians that politically I don't agree with. Usually they're not strictly political comics, but uh, I've seen comedians crack funny jokes who I don't agree with. Um, I don't, so I'm not ragging on her for that. Like if she actually said something funny, I would have said, all right, that's still a good joke regardless of her politics or, but no, it was just, she was literally up there just regurgitating like old Babylon B. Yeah. Articles like yeah. Uh, it was everything about uh, I identify as a, uh, as a yeah, was just yes. every, everything over and over again. That was she did at least in like a two minute clip that I saw. She did that joke at least three different times yep. within that two minute clip. Yep. Yeah, she did the Ted Cruz. Uh, my pronoun is kiss my ass. Like, she it's, did it's, that. it's like bottom of the barrel stuff. Yeah, like, yeah. just. It's like old person get off my lawn stuff, you know, yelling at the cloud stuff. Just, just she was just screaming and complaining and bitching about stuff that she doesn't understand and doesn't like. And there's not a single punchline. There's not a single joke. And the crowd just eats it up. I don't know, man. Yeah, I mean, I mean, a lot of those guys, a lot, a lot of fans of conservative comedians just like hearing. Uh, yeah. Their their beliefs spoken back to them. It's all it is. They're not listening to it for comedy or entertainment value. Yeah. It's um you know uh propping up their own uh it makes them feel good. Yeah, oh, tell me what I want to hear. This this <laughs> yeah this famous person is behind what I have to say. What what I think. So uh which which is funny because it's usually I oh I think what this famous uh, person thinks because I heard it from them, but then also uh, hearing it from them. Makes me feel good about believing it. <laughs> yeah, man. It, it's something else. Jim Brewer's the worst, though. Oh, uh, he, he he literally just, uh, I mean, he needs help. Uh, he's uh, he's, he's hey, up there. The, his movements, I don't know what's going on with him. He's a weirdo. Yeah, man. He needs to uh, slow down a little bit, man. He's going to end up like, uh, what's that dude's name from Saturday Night Live? I forget his name, but yeah, man, he looks John, like John Belushi. Oh, <laughs> Something like that. He's going too hard. Oh man. <laughs> oh man, but oh no, man, man, it's something else. But anyway, man, I tried. No, it was great. A great conversation. Hey, great <laughs> conversation too. I really appreciate it. This was great, Brian. Have a have a great night. Thank you. I say Brian is Alex Jones, brother. Oh, I'm sorry, Alex. I didn't mean to. I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> I was resurrected. <laughs> oh, we got two Alex Jones talking to each other now. What's gonna happen? I got a clown, brother. All right, oh, Alex Jones here. Let me tell you something about the uh, uh, super male vitality juice you should be drinking. It's only uh, <laughs> $25 for one can at the infowars.store.com.org. Uh, have a great night, Brian. If you get a bottle longer than 12 hours, it's all good. All right, you take it easy. Peace. Uh... Back to the phones. Hey, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Hello. Hello. Sorry. Can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you. Uh, uh, hey, what's your name? Where are you calling from? My name is um, uh, Cameron Robinson. I'm trying hey. to pause your damn video, but you keep talking, man. Oh, I'll stop talking so you can pause. Maybe that'll can you slow, up slow the video down. <laughs> can you just stop talking so I can pause this? Yeah, go ahead. Well, I paused it and then... Uh, okay, no, it worked. Okay, uh, great. How you doing, Cameron? Hey, this isn't Cameron. This is Alex Jones uh, calling <laughs> it again. Uh, this, this is a secondary Alex Jones call. How you doing, secondary Alex? I'm doing fine. I uh, just wanted to call in about, like, uh, I didn't watch your show because, you know, I don't. Um, but uh, I did uh, come in for, like, uh, the after show because um, I'm a narcissist. 
And um, man, you still got that same skull cup, don't you? What? I just see you like all the time with this. You got this cup. It's got a skull. Oh, oh, right, 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 right. The skull cup, right? Yes, this is my. This is the cup I usually drink out of on the show, right? I yeah. love this cup. It's so, it's so cool. <laughs> but don't you ever look at that and like look at that corn syrup filled, caffeine, sugar, melting at your teeth? Have you ever had a nerve pulled from one of your teeth? Uh, no, I have not. It sounds like it hurts. It is the most intense uh, pain I've ever felt. And I've given birth to three uh, children. <laughs> <laughs> but it's full of poison. And uh, you're really not doing yourself any credit by ingesting toxic things like that. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I... Uh... I, I feel like I'm entitled to my one vice, right? I mean, I don't, I don't smoke. I don't do any sort of drugs. I don't uh, drink alcohol. Uh, caffeine via uh, sodas seems to be my, my thing, unfortunately. Yeah, you shouldn't be... Fuck this later. <laughs> I'll do that later. Yeah, but you really got to take care of yourself, man. I know, I know, I don't know. I, I'll take that in... <laughs> Uh, I didn't, know, but I did uh, know you were talking about futurists. I don't know what the fuck you're you, hell. Or, I'm sorry, I don't want to curse on your uh, show. I don't want to get you. No, you could. By. It's your curse, and it's. I'm not gonna get. Uh, YouTube says it's fine to curse as long as you don't do it over and over and over. And over. Okay. Um, I'm gonna get my salt and my uh, voodoo equipment. <laughs> I bought it from some guy. Uh, he said he uh, he he said he was like Jamaican. That's where voodoo comes from, right? I don't know. I'm pretty good at getting scams. Remember where I was in all that crypto stuff? But um, you know these futurists you were talking about. Yes. I learned about them in school. Oh yeah. They're fascists. Right. Yeah. That's what we talked about. Yep. Oh, did you? Yeah. Fuck, I thought I had a good, I thought I had a, like an extra take. When I could, uh, do you talk about the Italian futurists? Uh, yeah, that's exactly what we talked about, yep. Because uh, I think you missed, you're saying you missed the first half of the show, right? Basically, uh, yeah. Nick Fuentes' latest thing is that he's going for the, uh, the futurist sort of aesthetic. Um, if you of the, getting in a car crash and dying and then uh, going to war and uh, blowing everything up and oh well, yeah yeah that 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 part I guess he's keeping it all about like hey let, let's go fast let's like kill things let's destroy everything uh, and it's like yo pure emotion man we're gonna go get it, get it it's basically like uh, the hillbillies that I grew up with who went out in the woods. And uh, I don't know what they were doing out there. I went out there one time, but I blacked out. But anyway, I just want you to be uh, healthy. I want you to stay away from these futurist people that you seem to have been talking to. Um, I don't know if your guest was a futurist. Like I said, I don't watch your show. No, he um, obviously was not a futurist. But he uh, he uh, broke down uh, what, what it was and uh, why Fuentes and how Fuentes is sort of... Uh, I guess uh, appropriating it for his uh, next uh, sort of uh, push of his white nationalist uh, beliefs. Why would someone? Yeah, I know. Appropriate it's... like a niche, like sort of art h historical. Uh, I guess is important. What I, what, I, I what, I, what I sort of what I sort of pulled out of it was. It seems pretty clear that, and judge this is from this the rally videos, and I think a lot of people made this sort of connection too. Fuentes has clearly been influenced by uh, Kanye West's uh, visual art style and a lot of his music videos and stuff. And I'm sure spending a I'm lot of time. Aware, I'm not aware and not willing to concede that Kanye West has a visual art style, but continue. Right there, you go. Okay, but um. His time spent with Kanye also probably introduced him to a number, num, excuse me, a number 
No, of, Numble is probably correct. Numble, too, yeah. <laughs> a number of Italian sort of uh, designers and such, because Kanye's obsessed with that stuff. And a lot of those probably have very uh, fascist roots in Italy. Um, and uh, he's sort of aesthetically taking that sort of uh, art and also aesthetically taking that sort of, uh, not just aesthetically, I should say, using that sort of art to uh, push forward. Appropriating. That's the word I'm looking the for. Italian Thank you. art. Appropriating. Of your great it. ancestors. Yes. Thank you. You're an Italian, right? Uh, partially, yes. I'm, I'm part I, Italian, yes. That's what yep. I was. I don't want to be Fredophobic. <laughs> You're not Fredophobic, don't worry. Only uh, what, what, who who was so angry at that? Oh, the Cuomo's, right? They were right. That was who forgot about them. Aren't they Italian? Why would they be so angry at the Italians? No, no, no. no. They were uh, they were upset because uh, someone like Donald Trump or someone called them Fredo or something like that. <laughs> yeah, guess what, Italians? You're white. Yeah, that's true. Fucking <laughs> Roman Empire came over, turned my uh, Pictish ancestors uh, into fucking Romans or whatever. We were just up there being naked, carving circles in the rocks and shit. Anyway, yeah. as long as you uh, are not involved with any of these futurists, I feel like I've done my due diligence and just. That's it. You, you, you I'm say, just reaching out as a friend and not as like I, a caller. I appreciate it. I, this I, isn't you, like an official call. Cameron, you are my Jonah Hill. Yeah, <laughs> I've been waiting to get like the big teeth installed from Wolf of Wall Street or All whatever right. the hell that movie was. Big Short. One of I confused those two movies. But Jonah Hill had sweet ass big teeth. He just had giant teeth. Oh man, I can't wait to get those. I got a white card because I'm on social insurance because uh, or social assistance because I don't make any money. So I could probably just like get my dentist to say, hey, this guy needs giant fucking Jonah Hill teeth installed, and then I can take that over to the dentist, get it done all done for free all at once. So I'm gonna do that right as soon as I end this call and have a good night, and I'll be seeing you tomorrow morning. Good night. Have, take care, Cameron. Always a pleasure when you call in. Bye. All right. Let's go back to the... Oh, uh, let me... Oof, just lost the calls. Feel free to call in. Space Karen with a super chat. Jordan Peterson might call in soon. Rumor has it. What? The Jordan Peterson is going to call into the show? No. No way. I'll believe it when I see it. Um. Hey, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, it's Charlie from Washington. How you doing? Hey, Charlie, I'm doing good. How are you? I'm well. I'm hanging in there. <laughs> I hear uh, you. I hear you. Hi. So, so uh, what was it to talk about? I'm gonna talk about my Monday a little bit, but before I do that, what what the hell was up with that that weird like? Bad 80s music video thing that Quintus was doing there. He's like a knockoff. He's like a knockoff Corey Hart in person here. Jesus yeah, Christ. Yeah, he's going for it. He's going for for something. He's going for some sort of, uh, uh, you know, nostalgia aesthetic or something. Yeah, those crosses in the background remind me of like a Windows 95. Uh, let me pause this here. Uh, Windows 95 screensaver from back in the freaking day or some shit. Yeah, yeah. That's, it did look like that. It's, absolutely. You know, he he wears sunglasses at night, not to keep track of visions in his eyes, but in in the vain hopes that nobody will recognize him. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I wanted to talk about um, the, the real estate market out here because um, I'm trying to buy a house. Uh, oh. And where where I don't want uh, uh, I don't want to ask specific, but I guess state wise. Well, I, Statewide. Yeah, I, I live in Western Washington. I live in Enumclaw. It's not really that big of a deal. It's kind of a hick town, but I'm looking around at some of the, some of the uh, the the apartments here, and 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 I've come to the conclusion they don't make places to live for single people. It's all like two bedroom apartments, and they're all like 
15 to 18 hundred dollars and you don't get like in unit washers or anything like that and i kind of need that because i don't want to be at the public wa- uh public uh laundromat washing my stuff when somebody sees my lady things and decides to go at me you know <laughs> it's it's kind of a safety issue for me right and so i'm like okay well you know i, I uh, looking around at some of these houses and like some of the some some of the monthly payments for for these things are are like half that. It's nuts. So you know, I uh, I went into a credit union yesterday to just to ask because I don't have very good credit. I don't have a down payment. I don't have like I'm just like at the very stage one of of like all of it, and it went about as well as I expected. You know, it's it's. Not very likely to happen. She suggested like getting a, a one of those like prepaid credit cards to try and build credit, and then like that's gonna take years. So I was kind of upset about that. And then when I got home, I found out about the they they started suspecting that the Tennessee shooter is a, is a trans man, which that was a mood shooter indeed. But I'm doing right. better today though. But right, hey, that that's another thing I kind of want to like bring up a little bit is um there's a lot of people that are kind of confused as to what a trans man actually is because when when people talk about trans people they talk about trans women they don't right. really so they'll, the rights are like oh it's another trans woman and there's just another man in a dress coming for your kids and all that nonsense and blah 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 so uh, you know trans man is not the same thing you know guys like and, it, and that doesn't even matter anyway right like a mass shooter is a mass shooter is a mass shooter like that's you know and and it's only been like what three or four of them out of like 200 2080 or something like that over the last six years yeah i wouldn't even i wouldn't even um don't even argue with that with them it's just uh you know it's not even worth i mean in, there is no arguing with that yeah the, the, they're, i they're mean not- i i've pretty much i've pretty much ignored the reaction about the shooting on uh line it's just not worth the uh the the giving them the the space to even run with this sort of stuff. The clear problem is, the 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 one thing that consistently brings every single one of these mass shootings together is the ease at which the shooter was able to access guns of mass destruction. Really, yeah. Uh, and Which- on on top of that, um. You know, think about the victims, uh, the very young kids here, uh, always, obviously all loss of life is sad, but, you know, obviously the loss of life that's barely even gotten a chance to live uh, is certainly extra depressing. Yeah. Um, and I'm, and I'm don't waste, sure don't even waste the time on the, <laughs> the right wingers out there who are trying to use this in the same way that they historically used every act of terrorism in this country to demonize all Muslim people. Um, yeah. You know, it's, yeah. the sa- it's the same thing. It's the sa- they, they go to the same thing every single time. Um, yeah. And like you said, too, they don't even know what they're angry about this time because they don't when, know what they're talking about. when the news, when the news first <laughs> dropped, when the yeah. news first dropped, they were all about how rare it is to see, because it was first said that a woman um, you know, was the shooter, and they were all going on and on about how rare it is for uh, a mass shooter to be female, to be a woman. And then they started right away speculating how, oh, it's got to be a trans woman. And I saw gross shit about, oh, they should check if, like, you know, uh, she's got a penis and all this ridiculous bullshit they usually run with. Um, and then it came out that it was a trans man. And they're and, still doing it, though. And this, this, blow, this blows up their whole sort of thing, too, because their whole idea was, uh, you know, it, their whole thing is, A, uh, trans people are what they were born as biologically, and that's who they are. There's nothing that could, they could do to change it. And then they simultaneously were arguing that um, no way this was a woman shooter because we wanted to be a trans woman shooter meaning in their view it would have been an actual uh you know biological man to them like that's what they would have went with um but in this case in what they view it as it it is actually 
would have been, would be what they would call a, 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 a an actual biological woman, because this was a trans man, aka a female to male uh, trans person. Yeah, and they just it, don't know how to handle that because it, it, they don't know have an argument for that one because they've never never spent the time on that one. Honestly, we see this same thing whenever that the the, the sports thing comes up. Um, whenever they go on about trans uh, people playing in sports and how oh they should be playing with uh, their their biological equals, meaning trans women should only be able to play men's sports and trans men. Well, they never think about this one through, but if they only want trans women to play men's sports, then by that same line of thinking, they need, they want trans men to play women's sports. And there's always that photo of that, uh, that trans wrestler, uh, Mac, uh, I forget his last name, but, uh, his picture would regularly go viral on, on the right. And it shows this trans man wrestling women in the women's wrestling division in his high school because they wouldn't let him compete with men, which is what he wanted to do because they were going by his, you know, the sex he was born as. Um, and so they only let him compete in the women's division, even though he wanted to compete against the men. And they would trot this out as, oh, look at this trans woman destroying women in her, uh, in her, uh, you know, in her, uh, league because she was actually born a man. But it was actually the right, the, the reverse. Th that example of Mac, the wrestler is exactly what they argue for. They want a trans man to wrestle women, even yeah. though he was defeating all of them and didn't really want to do that. He wanted the challenge and yeah. they, but they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't know what to do when it comes to the other side like, of it. Leah Thomas ended up actually like dropping a little bit in in her performance when when she when she swapped over to the women's division after like being on 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 her stuff. But like you know, and, and I, I agree with you on 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 in trying to ignore them. I mean, I I I have feeds that I'm just I'm gonna see it everywhere. That's just how it is. It's something I'm gonna have to something I'm gonna have to look at every day. And, you know, I, I have a few thoughts on, like, what the after effects are going to be on this. Aside from, you know, like you pointed out, ignoring the people who died, because that's, you know, that's not like that's the important thing or nothing. God forbid. Right. But like since it was an attack on on what appears to be some kind of a Christian school, we're going to be hearing about this for years. Right. Um, I mean, it, they're, they're, it's not going to be they'll, like, they'll like, move. They'll move on to something else. I mean, uh, I don't think so. I, I don't. Uh, it's not going to be because one of the things about Christians, especially Christian fundamentalists, is they they have one of the reasons they have a persecution complex is because they they think that in the Bible, if if people are persecuting you, that means you're being a good Christian. So this is just like gold for them. So we're probably going to be hearing about this for a long time, unless maybe. Something, Maybe. I mean, I mean, they were obsessed with that that shooter who claimed to be non-binary, even though it later came out that this guy was a. a yeah, he dropped it. He dropped it because he wasn't actually. He was a right wing anti LGBTQ troll, and he used the the non-binary claim app when he was a, you know, when he was arrested for the mass shooting, to sort of get like one last, uh, you know knock at the lgbtq community i mean that's what that was all about that came out that he was yeah. not actually non-binary identifying it was a it was bullshit um but they still run with that but they dropped it though they only run with it when it's convenient that, that that's not it, something they usually go with i think it's end up being the same because they got only they have no troll. they have no way to they have no strategy which is good for us to actually speak to normal people like, even after it came out that this person, this shooter, was transgender, um, the main, aside from the right, the main talking, uh, the main discourse around it, I should say, the main discourse around the shooting, other than the obvious of, you know, the, the families and the victims, but the, the, the political discussion surrounding the shooting, for most average people, the, the average American citizen wasn't transgender issues. It was gun control. 
You could see it in what was trending online. You can see it in discussions happening. Uh, this, excuse me, the discussions happening on various social media platforms. It, it, it's only in their little right wing bubble where they tell their little insider stuff that they think everyone understands, but no one outside their bubble does. Do they think this? No one is going to. Luckily, I mean, sadly, you know, this is always the case, uh, as we saw in the 2000s. But again, the media, uh, when it comes to Muslim people, but again, the media dynamics different now, too. If social media was around back during, uh, you know, post 9-11 Iraq war years, I think uh, uh, Muslim people would have had uh, more uh, people standing up for them, too. Um, Sadly, that was not the case, though. Um, yeah, but I remember but, uh, a lot of the Islamophobia. That was yeah. that was one of the things that pissed me off the most about all of it. And that's actually the one of the things that um, further broke me off from conservatism was because, like, you know, I saw the way they were treating them. I'm like, dude, they're just they're just people. They're they're they don't you know the the extremists don't speak for them, and that's that's kind of what helped break break me away from that pretty early right. on. Right. They're and, I, things. and also, kind of I thing. I haven't seen like another major thing to point out is like whenever there's some like right wing influence shooter and we don't know why this school shooter uh this trans shoot the, the the shooter who identifies as trans uh who's deceased now I should say too we don't know why they did what they did i'm certainly that'll come out um and you know it will will take that when that comes out but when a right wing uh influenced shooter does what they do there's always a jump from the right to defend the shooter's ideology in some way. You need to oh, yeah. understand where this is coming from. Well, if, you know, if you keep treating white, you know, young white men this way, this is what happens. You, you know, sort of blaming the victims and, and society, uh, making the shooter as some sort of victim. I haven't seen yeah. anyone do this to this shooter. This shooter, as all shooters are, trans or not, white supremacist or not, whatever their race, religion, color, or creed is, especially if you target innocent children, it's a piece of shit. No defending yeah. them whatsoever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I, you know, I, I will say that I kind of have two things that I suspect will probably happen as, as a result of this. One will get people like. Tucker Carlson is an example. Either they'll manage to somehow get their hands on that manifesto because you notice, like, whenever it's a right wing shooter, like, oh, we can't release the manifesto. We don't want copycats, even though we get copycats anyway. So, really, what's the point? And, you know, if they don't get it, they'll probably be like, why can't we get a hold of this? What is the left hiding? You, you know, that's what they're, they're fucking predictable as fuck. And the other thing is, uh, we might actually finally get to see the right. Um, care a little bit about uh, gun control laws, but specifically for trans people. I I, I don't doubt for a second that that they would do that. But uh, honestly, I really wanted to talk more about like uh, what the real estate deal out here is because I'm kind of curious. I know New York is an expensive place to live. I was wondering how bad it is out there. Oh, I mean, I. Uh... There's no such thing. I, as, I don't know. There's no such thing as there's no place. such thing as buying here. Uh, that's out of everyone's reach. Um, I, well, not even just buying, like renting too. Oh, renting. Yeah, I mean, we got we got lucky. We um, we found a uh, uh you know, a, a rent stabilized place right during the pandemic. Uh, we were able to. I mean, we're. I don't feel bad because I'm not a gentrifier. I'm a lifelong born, bred, raised Queens, New Yorker. Uh, so I don't mind taking the, the what's here for me. Uh, but we got uh, some people moved out, uh, I'm assuming, due to the pandemic. And uh, an apartment opened up. And uh, we got uh, lucky. We have a, a small two-bedroom at a uh, probably what's considered an undermarket price. And... Because it's stable, because it's <coughs> stabilized. Bless you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Because it's stabilized, they can only ra- raise it uh, something like one or two or I think three percent max every year. Um, so 
you know, they can't really, uh, luckily, if we, if we just decide to stay here forever, we can't, it doesn't seem like we'll ever get really priced out. Um, unfortunately, though, you know, we are a family of four and two of them are young children and this is only a two bedroom. And to be fair, it's really like a bedroom and a half. The second bedroom is very small. Um, uh, and yeah. so, you know, eventually we'll have to move and, and that's where I'm worried because, uh, you know, we've always been in Queens. This is where I, like I said, born, bred, raised, uh, uh, never left, and uh, I, I don't see a, a when the time comes. I don't see a, a way to get around. Possibly having to leave uh, New York City as a whole. Um, oh, I don't I know if, the, I, yeah. if you're born and raised in New York. You know that's your home. I, I, I would feel I would feel awful if I had to leave where I live because it's this where my heart is. You know. Um, but you know, I, I've had experience with with being kicked out of places because. When I was like halfway through fifth grade, my parents got kicked out of the the apartments we were living at because they wanted to raise the rent and they couldn't legally do that with us there. So they made up some bullshit excuse. And then just last summer, actually, the place that I was living at, first of all, is a shitty house. Like most of the houses out here are they're like almost 100 years old, you know, weird wonky wiring. Um, the last place that I lived at uh bad insulation one of the windows upstairs broke you wouldn't fix the wind the landlord wouldn't fix the window it, every winter ended up costing me like 900 fucking dollars in electricity just so we wouldn't freeze to death you know it's fucking ridiculous but he decided and i had to have like four other roommates right i place. mean bef- it, was bef- just, it was just fucked before but, we lived before we lived here we lived in a, a, a very small one bedroom and we had we did have two kids for a portion of that time and basically, uh, you know, I was uh, sometimes stuck sleeping on the couch because there just wasn't any room. We were all stuck in one bedroom. Um, it sucks. It absolutely. I think like everybody is is struggling when it comes to, and that's like that's the major expense too. Like when we really talk about why we are, uh, you know, financially strapped. Like for the vast majority of people. The number one regular expense, you know, not counting, you know, when, when people have to go into medical debt, but that's never planned or um, God willing, not reoccurring usually either. Um, but, you know, every we got to we got to pay rent every month. And it's easily the, the biggest expense that I have. I'm sure the vast majority of people, too. I mean, it's the thing that that I, th- I think uh, holds people back. Uh uh, a lot of the times from exploring, uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, new career paths, new opportunities. Uh, the fact that you need that uh, medical insurance too. I just uh, that's another thing. But uh, I, I do think rent probably is the bigger factor. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's, it's not <laughs> it's it's not smart to do it, but you can't. You, you could probably go without uh, insurance uh, if you're that strapped for money. And if there's also you know, Medicare for most people to, to get on. When it comes to, to, to shelter, you're either homeless or you're, you're paying rent somehow, you know? Yeah, you know, and the thing that pisses me off the most about the last place, because this is a pretty walkable town. I, I like to walk everywhere. I mean, I love my car to death, but whenever, when and where I can, I walk. Um, and, you know, we moved out of that house because he decided he wanted to sell the place when the interest rates were going up and he wanted to get rid of it. And, you know, like the week before we're, we're moving out, that's when he fixes all of the windows. That's when he fixes the fence that, that had blown out from one of the big ass storms because it's super fucking windy out here. You know, like a week or two before we're out of there. That's when he finally, after years and years of harping on him to get him to try and do anything about that. But I, I walked by that house the other day and there's, there was a for sale sign there. It's gone now. The house is empty. So I'm thinking I'm thinking he sold it to a private equity firm, which yeah. is another yeah. fucking huge problem. It's driving up all of the fucking the prices around here, and it's just it's just so ridiculous. So I'm like, you know, fuck it, fuck renting. You know, I can find a house out here. I mean, they're all it's it's hard to find anything under two hundred thousand dollars, which is fucking expensive. But you know. If I find a decent like two or three bedroom house, you know, I can rent a couple of places out. I know one of my former roommates would live a cheaper place. I just gotta be cheaper than uh, eight hundred and fifty because that's what she's paying just for her rent to live out of somebody else's house. And you know, and and this is a middle of nowhere hit down. There's you know, and it, it's it, the place I'm at now is with my 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 high school buddy and his girlfriend and her uncle. 
and they're great people. They're not interested in like kicking me out anytime soon because you know they're they're not like that. But I, I do kind of feel like I'm intruding a little bit. And honestly, I want a place of my own. I, I'm almost forty. Damn it, you know I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm mean, 37 at the end of June. So like, goddamn. So I, I'm still gonna try it, but like. It's just it, you know I had events a little bit about that. No, I hear you. I mean it's 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 rough. It's it's hard. Uh, I don't know what we would do. I mean if I mean it's I'm we, we're never going to own in New York City. That's for sure. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't mean look. That. I don't mean look. I mean in in, in uh, my area of Queens, there's like a cheap house would be like even the even the the co-ops and condos here. We're talking like seven hundred k for like a one or two bedroom. Yeah, that's ridiculous as uh, fuck. And that's the low. That's like the low end. Um, I mean, you, uh, and that's Queens. Um, you know, uh, you'll probably find maybe like a dilapidated property for less than that. But then, obviously, then you got to put money into fixing it up before you can live in. Um, yeah. Yeah, maybe Long Island. Maybe uh, there's a future for us in Long Island. I mean, it, Long Island is in New York, but it's close enough where the commute wouldn't be bad if we really wanted to go, you know, come home and see people and, uh, you know, go to Manhattan as a quick, uh, you know, uh, train ride. Uh, maybe, maybe not too far upstate. I don't know. I mean, it's not New York. You're right. I mean, I, I would, my first time not living in New York City if we had to do that. Oh, that would suck, though. Uh, you know, God willing, you'll have a place of your own where you don't have to deal with a landlord. Because honestly, landlords can suck a fat one. But uh, right, right. Uh, as long as we yeah. can stay, honestly, we'll, t- we'll as long as we can stay here, we'll we'll do that. Because I mean, uh, I, I will I, say this. I will say this. The the we, we've been, we've been fairly lucky when it comes to landlords. To be honest, um, we haven't had any major issues, well, and we've had and we've yeah. had both. You know private property owner landlords like just a guy who owns a bunch of houses or whatever renting them out and then we've also lived in uh you know big real estate management company owned apartment buildings um i will say and i you know and there are obviously a few scenarios where this is this the truth um the 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 better experience, at least when it comes to landlords, is as good of an experience you could have with a landlord. In my opinion, barring one landlord we had who was a good guy, um, the management companies are more responsive than <laughs> the uh, the small business owner landlords. Honestly, it just is what That's it is. Surprising, actually. You don't expect corporations to be good at anything other than screwing people out of money. <laughs> Well, I'll, be, I'll, I'll be honest, there there are also a number of different small businesses that are usually, because usually, uh, uh, especially when it comes to customer service and support, from my experience, and, and this is people who, who are my, my experience working uh, for small businesses too, bigger companies tend to have to deal and worry with lawsuits and, and actual regulations and, and actually playing by the rules. Where a lot of small business owners think they could get away with bullshit, and this is—I mean, I know people who have worked for small business tyrants, and you know? they tell me too that like they would much rather work for a big retail company than work for like some like a uh, uh, small business owner cafe. It's it's bizarre, honestly. Uh, you know, I think you're onto something with that because I there's a lot of small business owners out here, and I've worked for more than a few of them, and they it hasn't ended well. Like, and, and I'm not uh, saying I'm not saying this like the big corporation or the big management company is 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 no, nicer no. or better. I'm saying they actually deal with the consequences, so they actually respond in a more timely manner and try to actually provide customer support or service, just so they don't have to deal with the bullshit that's going to come their way. Whereas a lot of these smaller companies know they can get away with it, and so they don't do anything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, before we go, um, uh, you know, to lighten the mood a little bit, you, your guest mentioned the hot tub time machine. And I was like, oh, yeah, that was a pretty good, like, 80s style movie with John Cusack. I love John Cusack in there. And immediately the movie that popped into my head was Gross Point Blank. Have you ever seen it? Um, no. Oh, wait, I, I think I have. It seems it, it sounds it, very familiar. One where he play he, well, him and his twin sister, Joan, uh, he plays an assassin who goes back to his high school for a high school reunion and Dan Aykroyd's the bad guy in it. Oh, I think it, I've seen this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a great movie. I also really liked um, 
when he was like in, in more, more of a kid, he did uh, there's there's a movie called Better Off Dead, which is hilarious and it's just weird out there shit going on and uh, uh, One Crazy Summer, which uh, also has Bobcat Goldwaite in it, which is pretty good. But you know, I I I, I like a lot of eighties movies because it's that's the era I was born in. I'm obsessed with it as a decade. No, eighties well, eighties movies, nineties movies, uh, movies post. Uh, 2010. I feel like the the years, the early 2000s. Uh, that's a whole movie period. I try to avoid. I always find the movies from that era to be so bad. I, I tend to stick from about the mid 90s back. You know, it, like I like older movies. I'll I'll watch movies from the 50s. I'll even watch silent films. I've seen a few of them. Like I, uh, Metropolis is actually a pretty fun film. All oh, right, I, I was I I saw a lot of them because I went to film school, so I had no choice. And I will I will say that some of those early silent film comedies, they were doing some really fucking uh, crazy, uh, unique and funny shit. Like literally, like they were really the on the yeah, like uh, injured the hell out of a lot of them. I'm sure. I'm sure a lot of them had bad back problems and stuff. You know, because they, you know, no real racialations or anything like that. I'm sure you, you wouldn't be surprised to get all if you look into the history or biography of some of the older actors and like in their later days, kind of like wrestlers. You know, it's just one of those things where like it's just gonna hurt you, right? After, after a certain amount of time. But uh, any, anyway, I'll let you go and get, get to some of the other colors. I think I'll take it up for your time. No, it was great. Thank you. Have a great night. Yeah, you too, bud. Bye. Uh, what time is it? Oh, we could take probably one, one, maybe, maybe two more calls. Definitely one more call. Hey, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, what's up, Matt? It's Ogle. Hey, Ogle. You are, uh, oh, I couldn't tell if you were covering the camera or you were fixing it. Do you want me to pull you up on the feed or, or yes or no? Yeah, you can pull me up. Okay, cool. Because I, I was going to, but then I saw you covering the camera, but then I noticed you were actually fixing it, so I couldn't tell. Uh, so what was it to talk about, Ogle? How you doing? Uh, I'm doing well. Um, yeah. Uh, I wanted to talk about uh, AI. I've called you a couple of times about this now, and there's been so many developments and uh, interesting things in media, so I just want to kind of check in with you. Yeah, let's let's talk AI, my favorite current topic. Uh, still have the same feelings about it. Uh, <laughs> um, what we, what, 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 what we, what, uh, let me ask you, where do you want to start? Um, well, personally, I've been using it all day recently, working on projects, um, working on programming. Um, I'm just able to write code in languages that I don't know. I just say. Uh, you know, hey, chat, chat, beat GPT. I, I need this code to do something, and it's in this language, and um, it'll create the code, and I'll put it in, you know, run it on my uh, on my iPhone, and I'll get an error, you know, often, and I'll tell what the error is, and and it'll be like, oh, I'm, it'll apologize and say, well, here's the fix for it, and uh, you plug that in, and do that enough times, and then your ideas, you're just able to kind of make your ideas happen, um, which I used to have to do by struggling often figuring out the logic for things how to put different pieces together and this just you just kind of just go through this practice of just working on this project together with it and so that 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 i've been spending a lot of time doing that but there's been a lot of interesting things with uh on twitter with uh, some viral pictures too right i mean i i will say it does seem like um it does seem like uh Perhaps with programming, um, the AI bots have been helpful there because I guess it's, I don't know, more of a, a streamlined thing for it to figure out via all the information that's out there on like GitHub and probably all the other points of data that it references. Um, so, you know, uh, that could be one of those use cases that I brought up as is like a great tool that helps people uh, work uh, more productively and 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 quicker. Honestly, um, with the with the photos though, I still I still don't see it. I mean, yeah, of course it's gonna fool you know your grandma and aunt on Facebook, but I mean I can look at any of those photos and tell right away whether it's AI generated art or not. They all look like oil paintings. They're all missing various fingers or limbs or um, they're holding items that just look alien and do not exist. 
or uh, whatever they're supposed to be holding or walking by literally um, uh, becomes a part of their body at some point <laughs> in the photo. I mean, again, the, the use case for it I can see will, will be to, um, you know, um, accentuate or heighten or upgrade uh, an existing piece, like uh, maybe aiding a, a video artist in, in, in creating a, a visual effect uh, better. Um, but I just don't, I still don't see it replacing anybody. Uh, you know, I, I just, it's, it's, I, I, I don't know if I said this on the phone with you or if I said this on another, another episode, but this is to me much more akin to, um, when good video and photography cameras, uh, 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 when good, uh, you know, uh, when smartphones, I should say started to implement good quality uh, image uh, capturing via the video and, and photo cameras on their phone. Um, didn't replace filmmakers, just made things more accessible so people could do more creative things with it. Yeah, for sure. Um, and uh, we are seeing people do those things now with it, with these images, um, with the, 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 the dripped out Pope. Did you see that one? Yeah, I did. That's that's that one. I I knew right away. Uh, yeah. or his, well, it's not necessarily about tricking, but it is. Uh, you know, whoever made that may very well not have been an artist before that. And I wouldn't argue that right now they are an artist. Um, that's debatable. Um, but it was a as a piece of work that you know people enjoyed as one would some creative work, and uh, it wouldn't exist if it wasn't for for the AI. Um, and it let this person express themselves and get some attention, you know, uh, using this tool. So it opened up that avenue of visual, you know, creativity um, and uh, getting, you know, you know, enjoying that. Um, but uh, to, to comment on also on the, um, you know, the being able to tell that it's AI and because you can see these weird artifacts, weird hands and all that. Yeah. Um, one of the most popular uh AI image generating uh, tools called Mid Journey, which uh, creates most of these impressive images. I think that people are seeing, uh, like recently got an up, like up, upgraded from version four to version five, and this solved a lot of the hand problems. Um, and that was a big giveaway. I, I, I had a lot of fun poking fun at people, um, creating like propaganda images, and you know. Not being like, hey, look at this cool AI thing I made, but being like, this is a propaganda image to get you all excited about it, like some tanky stuff. And these people have all these mangled hands, and the American flag has 13, or has like 52 stripes on it or something. Um, but uh, yeah, so like when Midjourney version six comes out, you know, like, you know, like it, it's going to be even harder to tell. It's going to get harder and harder. And uh, it's, you know, I think my first call about AI was just a couple of months ago, and I, I feel like, uh, you know, it's a, things are going fast. And, I, uh, I do think we're in a, just, I, I do okay. think we're in a classic uh, tech industry hype bubble though with AI. I think it's just as fast as it's going, it's gonna die down really fast. Um, I, I saw a great tweet and it made you know that's what I've been trying to say, but this person had a great example. And this is from a tech person. This is from someone who's a full time uh, software as a service developer. Um, I forget his name. I'll, I'll try to find the tweet, but he compared this to, and I, rem I remember this moment too. Maybe four, five years ago, maybe a little bit more, there was this big tech bubble around chatbots. Um, on every website, every website was gonna be able to do away with like the uh, the um, intercom customer service bullshit. They would all be just having automated chatbots running everything. And all these companies creating chatbots, doing selling chatbot services, were bringing in tons of money from VCs and this was going to be the future. But actual customers started having to deal with these chatbots over actual real people behind the customer service chats and they fucking hated it. And all these companies died away because people don't want to speak to a machine and they can tell. You can tell. Um, Chat GPT does not feel like you're talking to a person. You just, this doesn't. Um, it, it's, it's, if, if you're just looking for it to regurgitate information for, to you, 
you don't need it to sound like a person, I guess. I mean, that's part of the allure, I guess, in uh, in comparing it to a search engine, um, that it's more conversational in tone than you know a list of links are on Google. But if people are looking to use AI to replace um, socialization and stuff like that, uh, socializing, um, it's not going to happen. It's just people want to talk to humans. Um, and AI as it is today is nowhere. It's not even in the realm of being like the artificial intelligence we see in movies that like thinks and feels and, uh, you know, has a mind of its own. It's just, we're not there. And so I do think we are, and I do think we're in a hype bubble, uh, that's going to end up hurting what we actually have, uh, today that we call AI. Um, because, you know, I was following these AI writers. I remember before even chat GPT three, uh, not the GPT three. I remember before uh, GPT three, even I remember before when it was just open AI was just, uh, uh, you know, mostly used as an API and they weren't even the front, uh, end, uh, service. Um, and there was a bunch of these different AI writing apps over the past couple of years that were, you know, trying to get traction. Um, I thought that was like interesting. Oh, this is, this is neat. And then the hype machine came out trying to push it as something that it wasn't. And it totally turned me off of it. Yeah. The hype is real. Um, like there's a phenomenon of like AI influencers. Um, and like, I mean, like with any like exciting new technology, as exciting as it is, as powerful as it, as it is, the, like, yeah, the hype is good. People's imaginations about it are, are going to get ahead of them. And, and and that's just, that's what we're seeing. And, um, yeah, we're just in, in the middle of it. And, you know, it's just an interesting thing to behold. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's going to suck when the hype dies down and, um, you know, AI, uh, uh, takes a hit because of the hype, because like I said, I, I see utility here. It's not, analogous to crypto the the hype is right. but the actual utility is not analogous to crypto because there there are uses for uh you know current ai and, and i do think even ai art will will eventually end up uh working out a lot of the uh bullshit weighing it down and it will end up being more analogous to like my comparison to like good quality video being uh, achievable via your smartphone and where it's going to open up doors and not and, and make the actual artists uh even better um but uh you know as of right now the it definitely is uh the hype that we saw around crypto and um i think it's gonna hurt ai in the long run yeah and i think like with all these major tech res revolutions we've seen how like they benefit people's lives but I mean, just, you know, imagine a time before smartphones and we aren't all staring at our screens all the time and people hung out together more. It's like with every there's costs to, to the soul of humanity for for each of these revolutions. And, you know, it's not like we can. But, it's you know, it's just unfathomable that we can just like say, no, we're not going to have AI in society. Like, I guess we it's conceivable and, you know, maybe we'd all be better off like. In the long run and be better off if we all just you know went back into uh you know agrarian life or something i don't know but uh you know you know it's too late now obviously but maybe they should have <laughs> called it something else uh maybe ai wasn't the good name for it because it's listen like people already yeah. have people already have this notion of what ai is via um you know via via film for your movies and tv mm -hmm. shows um i mean i remember when people were using the term uh machine learning more than ai and i think that is a much better descriptor of what we currently have but that's i mean it's still used obviously but i remember when people were using it uh you know a couple of years ago to describe what they were offering as a service more so than they using ai um i remember mm -hmm. when deep fakes were were first sort of being covered and they were really, uh, you know, ac accentuating the machine learning part over any AI stuff. And I think it really, that's the better descriptor of what's going on here. The, the machine, you know, learning is also a, a, a loaded term, but, but mm -hmm. the machine is basically uh, intaking all this data, 
um, you know, and and using all the data it's it's at its disposal, it sort of um, tries to put together what the user is asking it for to the best of its ability. That's that's basically mm-hmm. what it is. And you know, as as it continues to uh, get asked questions by the user, it gets gets slightly better at figuring out what data that user is actually looking for. Yeah. But maybe it does make us question what is intelligence. Like we believe that we exist, right? But maybe we are all just chat GPTs walking around in flush suits. Yeah, yeah, I guess. I guess. Um Yeah, I mean, but we could we could we could we could actually though like think and um you know come up with creative ideas and um you know, problem solve and and critically think. Um, I don't think AI can do that, um, honestly. So, I mean, animals certainly can, um, mm-hmm. but I don't think AI can. I think I can just I can imagine it being indistinguishable. Mm, I, like, don't I, I don't know. I don't know. A human. And then me observing like an AI super sophisticated robot, like, you know, if they were both avatars in a game, like, would I be able to tell? I will say there probably are people out there who have much more in common with AI than (laughs) than a critically thinking sentient human. So I will hand you that. Uh, I'll give you. I'll give you that. Not everybody, but it's probably a good amount of people out there. Yeah. I don't know. All right. Oh, always a pleasure. I love the AI conversation. Um, there's gonna be a lot more of it. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah. And uh, maybe we can talk politics uh, next time. Also. Sounds good. Have a great All night. Right, Peace. Good night. All right, I'll do I'll do I'll do one more call. Let's see who gets in. Let's see who gets in next. I'll do one more call. Let's do this. There were like six people trying to call in before. Let's see what we got here. One more call. Let me check the super chats. Oh, Wanda Valentine with a super chat. Oh, let me get this call first. Hey, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey man, it's Omega. Hi, how's it going? Omega, how are you? Good, good. Um, what did they talk about? Well, to start, uh, aside from all the chaotic news, at least today, got to have some little serenity because it was my little one's birthday and it was a half day of work. So there you go. Oh, wow. yeah. happy birthday to your uh, to your kid. Yeah, yeah, it was actually quite nice. Uh, we couldn't do everything we wanted to do, but at least we got to go to the park, which is the first time in a while we got to go together. Um, well, to get into it, um. Because I haven't heard anybody talk about this. Correct me if I'm wrong. And I was like, yeah, I am a majority report a bunch of times about it recently. So out here in New York, they're trying to cut the funding to the public libraries. And they're also going to implement a thing where if a branch closes, they're not, they're just not going to, they're just going to let it close. They're going to let branches close pretty much straight up. They're not going to build new ones. And they're going to cut the hours and on top of that, cut weekends out altogether, which is a big issue because that's like, to be honest, that was like a resource before I got a laptop. That was a resource for me to print out, like, say, my resume when I wanted to go job hunting when I worked at just restaurants. There was like um, just different things. I mean, me and my family still take out books from the library because, I mean... We got kids and we'd like for them to read. My kid is into this one book series and the fact that the libraries are around is that how she's able to, you know, just keep like taking out different books of the series. So like, it's really upsetting because it's taking away like a public resource that a lot of people have and I kind of wanted to blast it on here. And maybe afterwards I'll just link you a Twitter thread and maybe you can like post about it or something like that and maybe mention it on Thursday. I don't know. Yeah, sure. On that part. Where, where, where is this happening again? So basically, public li- the, all the public libraries in New York City, pretty much because Mayor Adams is cutting that, which leads me to think 
he cut the funding for schools and put that towards cops. So I get a feeling something very similar will happen in this regard. And it's really upsetting because, so, I mean, I don't know if you drive to and from places all the time, but in public transportation, they're everywhere. But I get a feeling it doesn't really prevent anything, to be honest. And it, in fact, just makes people feel less at ease because obviously, how many videos do you see of cops just like straight up, you know, just getting very like forceful with like just about anybody. And like the ones by me, seems like they only care about people hopping the turns out in the train station. But other than that, it's like, it's a bit useless. And it's all, and it's all a matter of just like, okay, you just want ticket quotas. And since the end of the month, I mean, I'm expecting them to be a bit more enforced because of that reason. Because I bet at my train station, they wouldn't appear as frequently for you know, if not for the tickets that they generate that way. And, you know, that's that's just my thing. I just think it's like, it's absolutely disgusting that you're just killing another public good resource or just because you wanted to do that. And then, meanwhile, Mayor Adams can't even keep his own properties in order because he's got rats in them. And it's like, it, it doesn't make any real sense to me at he all. He is, I, I really do think he he's terrible. I mean, we need. He needs to go. He needs to absolutely go. Uh, the, the the cutting of funding from libraries, the um, the forcing people out of remote work just to please the Manhattan landlords and real estate companies. Um, the most disgusting thing I recently saw was him advocating for windowless bedrooms to deal with the housing crisis in New York. Uh, he thinks that no. it should no longer be illegal. Uh. It's illegal, in, it, it, to be clear, it's illegal to have, I don't know if it's the entire state, but certainly in New York City, it's illegal for bedrooms to not have windows as a safety precaution, as a fire hazard. Um, and he yeah. is advocating for windowless bedrooms. It is, gro- I mean, it's unhealthy, it's unsanitary, it's dangerous. Um, it's it's also like, depress. It's also depress. I mean, I me think he, yeah. He just makes me think. Like I say this around, and I don't know if this is gonna sound wrong or not. He looks like an evil grown up little Bill. He really does, and it and it infuriates me so much that he just like he literally just sides with all that crap. Um, I remember he was in like some stupid for some credit card thing or whatever that is some party that he went to because he parties up with people, and then I saw Cara Delevingne there because it's like. Oh, I'm so glad Cara Delevingne had the time and showed her big forehead there. And like, by the way, she's much tinier than you think she is. Like, I've walked by her. She is super. Not to not to say anything about your height, Matt, but she's about the same height as you. That's fine. So it's like, <laughs> but yeah, like it's 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 just wild. But anyways, like, so a person right there that literally stood up to a powerful person and spoke out about like stuff that he was doing to her and violating her. Meanwhile, you're kind of parting it up with people who want to, like, find their way into people's heads and be like, oh, I can do this. So I can, like, in regards to, like, some expense or whatever, because it's some credit card relating to rent related matters. And stuff like that. I don't know. It's it's outrageous. And I think it's I think he just he's too corrupt. And like he did crush my faith in the ranked choice voting system because the female candidates that were also campaigning at the same time as him. They, any of them would have, even the one that had issues with her, with her staff were immediately like leaps and bounds better than him. And it's so outrageous. I think because a lot of it, first of all, it's really embarrassing that like only about a million people voted in the city for the mayor, which is so outrageous. Cause like, but then again, it's, it's always a presidential, you know, elections that always get the most turnout. Everybody else couldn't give a shit less, and then they'll be the ones complaining. And they'll also be the ones trying to say, like, and if it's, like, a female person running or if it's a female person in office, they're going to try to find a way to kind of say that she doesn't deserve it or she never earned it. Like, Kathy Hochul, it's like, yeah, she still got voted into her position before she took over for Andrew Cuomo. So at the end of the day, she still got elected for her job, and she just won the governor election which she still i mean she sucks and all this stuff but at the end of the day it's like you can't just deny that but my other thing is just that 
So if you have this ranked choice voting thing, they're still going to play the same game that they played with Biden and Bernie, where they try to act like Biden was the only candidate and that's it. Like if you tuned into any corporate news thing, it'll be like Biden, 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 and like a little blip of Bernie, but it'll be just Biden all over the place and then make it look as if like there was nobody else running and like how dare you even like even think of anybody else at this time. We need this person. And then this is what we got. So I honestly like have little faith with that. So but I'll continue to vote and whatnot and hope to God that uh, the only thing I agree with that he did was um, he started to because a lot of places did go out of business also like in the last few years and they had their outdoor dining things and he did have introduce a program to like basically wreck their outdoor dining because a lot of those places did not take that with them. And I, what do I, those I, turn to? I, I will say a lot of that stuff was uh, not taken care of and, and pretty gross. And actually, uh, a lot of them were just storing garbage and furniture in there. It was pretty ridiculous. They became basically rat's nests. And that's the other situation. Because, like, yeah. uh, I mean, we're some of a pandemic, yes. And I, I would like it if people still use those. It's just that, like, it's impossible to clean unless you have, like, metal slabs that had right. no holes in them. Right. Which also, we don't live. Not gonna work. We, we don't live in an area of the country where you can do it year round. So if you don't, if they don't actually take care of it during the winter months when no one's using it, then it becomes absolutely disgusting. Yeah, it's like can you pass like a, a giant vacuum in there or something? It's like, yeah. it's like it's it's not it's not that difficult. I have a couch. I do that on occasion. I have like a different. I don't get it. it it's anyways. And my other thing. Uh, so WrestleMania is literally this week. It is. I am like in futility, but I'm gonna do my best to try to catch up on like the clips on YouTube because yeah, it's honestly, just just unreal. just watch the show. You'll ca- they'll catch you up with all the with the 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 uh, twenty minutes of video package before each match. <laughs> oh no, my thing is also my thing is also because I remember so like they did this when Batista turned heel. They did this when uh, Seth Rollins turned on the Shield. Little things here and there, like that were big enough moments, and they knew people were interested in them. They literally would play the living hell out of it for weeks, and it's just like, okay, yes, you did something that was interesting to people. Please don't run it into the ground. <laughs> it's like, thankfully, they didn't run Batista's in, uh, initial heel run after being world champion. You know, when he turned on Rey Mysterio and stuff like that. At least they didn't run that into the ground because it was cold, but. It's still they just do things like that, and also the other thing is it's still a matter of like you gotta wait till they do the payoff for these things because then if they just keep playing video clip of the initial thing, it's like, well, yeah, I mean that moment looks like very insignificant now because oh, oh, the next is looking insignificant because they still got beaten down by John Cena at the end of the day, despite the fact that John Cena was quote unquote fired and all this other stuff. It just, but I think this year is gonna be all right. I still do feel like Sami Zayn should have gotten a world title shot or something like that, to be honest. Uh, I think honestly, I'll, I'll, be, than Cody. I'll be fine with the Cody Reigns match if Reigns wins. I heard uh, I heard a rumor that he might be stepping away for a bit of time and just taking a little sabbatical because mm. obviously he's been running. I mean, he's I been think running he's running the show for a while. His, his reign has been great, um, and I think they should run with it for as long as possible. Give me, give me, a, give yeah. me, a, give me a new. Let's get someone to beat Bruno San Martino's record finally. <laughs> oh man, I don't know about that. Like, I'm, no, I'm joking. No, ever. Punk, that's gonna Punk's be an record. Un- like for a time was great because he at least like it still felt fresh enough because he faced different people, and like he turned in the middle of it, so it kept it like very interesting. And I actually found it more interesting when he was a heel. Because like they did try to make him like the the face that kind of does stuff. That's like okay in real life I would hate you right now if you were, if somebody was like this, the little things like that, and I would just like be annoyed. But thankfully, you know, they fixed that up. But I heard that they're speaking of which I heard that they were like throwing shots at each other now, like a lot. Who? Uh, Punk and AEW. I heard that they. Oh were, like, yeah, I see, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't even I don't even know what's going on. I'm not there. even caught up on the news. I got like yeah. I got a backlog of what culture news videos to keep watching. <laughs> All right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um All right, yeah. I mean, WrestleMania is this weekend. Usually I do a wrestling show, but I don't know. I just didn't didn't it didn't feel like this WrestleMania was connecting with me in that way, honestly. I'll probably end up doing a wrestling show maybe next week or the week after just you know, in the, in the wrestling spirit of the WrestleMania month of April, um, but 
you know, um, there's nothing really yeah. I could. Uh, we've already done a lot of episodes on. I mean, I guess there's still there's still a lot to be done with the Vince stuff. Honestly, maybe I'll look into doing an episode on that. Yeah, maybe maybe a scam academy one where like where the the main scam was that the fans felt scammed by Vince over and over again. <laughs> right, right. But like, I mean, they still make the money, but obviously, like, you know, stuff people would have like the admission tickets like would have been really sold through the roof if like he did certain things right just right. over time. But you know, that's a whole other big overarching topic. Right. Anyhow, so right. looking forward to that. Um, so we'll see like how the stuff unfolds and yeah, I am, I am not totally that interested in Cody winning though. So if Cody didn't win, I wouldn't be that upset to be honest, but I think it's, they might kind of have him because they, they probably promised him something too. All right. Yeah. That's my other thing. I really think that they probably promised him something too. I don't think he would just leave AEW for like a, a big paycheck for something related to Dusty. And that's it. I think it's a whole other thing too. Oh yeah. 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 No, they definitely, it, it was definitely part of his uh, deal coming and coming over here. Honestly. Yeah. Cause I do agree that like, I think when they when I first felt like he should have been in the main title the world title picture was like around ten years ago. Like after he had his runs with the IC title and like I think he should have like started gunning for the world title a little bit more now at that point. But you know, the whole Stardust thing happened and like at first it was interesting but then it lost the touch with me. But <laughs> Oh, well, I'm sorry. I'm just I'm getting tired now. I had to. We took uh we took the dog in today for his uh after you know uh, this evening I should say, for his um his first v- vaccinations because he's still just a little young pup. Uh, he's very big boy though, at 13 weeks. God, he's gonna be huge. Our our dog. So I think I'm feeling the. Uh, I made it to 11:30. I feel like I'm finally feeling the effects of all of of the day. Uh, so uh, Omega, yeah, we, we got we got that we got the big dad energy. Yeah, it was a pleasure talking <laughs> no, with you, Omega. Too sleepy. Last <laughs> anyway, call of the night, my friend. Have a great right. night. Always a pleasure when you call in. Uh, talk to you later. Same. Later. Peace. Um, but these people in the in the chat talking about um, uh, Batista's acting. He's been great. His movies have been great. He's a great actor. Honestly, much better career trajectory than any other pro wrestler who became an actor, honestly. Um, I did just see Knock at the Cabin. Um, I, 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 the, uh, the, the, the performances, especially Batista, was great. The actual story, I uh, wasn't a big fan of. I didn't like the, uh, the ending. I didn't like the messaging in that ending. Uh, I mean, the, I don't want to give it away. I don't want to give it away to anyone. I don't want to spoil it for anyone, but I wasn't a fan. And from what I understand, there was much more nuance in the book that it was based on and some different major choices M. Night Shyamalan took uh, that change a lot of the messaging that the book has. Um, it just it was a... Uh, uh, Bad message, especially for this time, a uh, period. Honestly, um, <clears throat> oh, direct live just brought up. They live with Roddy Piper, right? That's one of my favorite movies of all time. Honestly, um, literally one of my favorite movies of all time. They live. Thing is, Piper's great in that movie. Um. But he didn't get that many other chances to to provide such, uh, uh, you know. Uh, Also, oh, this probably this might be my last live stream as a legacy verified Twitter user. So I thought today. Uh, if if Elon Musk actually goes ahead and removes all blue check marks from the legacy verified accounts on Saturday, like he says he's going to, I thought it'd be fun to just you know one time, one last time. Uh, let's just say goodbye to the blue check mark. 
Leave the memories alone. And there it is. Just to let everyone know. Verified account. This is a legacy verified account. It may or may not be notable. I'll, I'll agree that is debatable. Am I notable or am I not? Certainly up for debate. But there's no denying I had a legacy verified Twitter account. <laughs> All right, folks. Uh, we'll we'll see, right? Uh, uh. Oh, oh, wait, wait. The, I had another um, uh, super chat and some uh, uh, Twitch stuff to read. Um. Oh, Mr. Blinky6000, thank you so much for subscribing to the uh, one month at Twitch uh, on Twitch. Really appreciate that. Um, also, um, oh, where was it on uh, YouTube? One second. Wanda Valentine with a $5 super chat. Can you tell us how the six of you and Leftist Mafia came together? You all seem to get along so well. Did you know each other before? Right. I, um, I, I knew um, just from live streaming and doing this and podcasting and being in the general leftist sphere. I knew David Dole, the Rational National, Mike Frigoredo of Humanist Report, Lance of the Serfs, um, and... Three of them have been on this show. I've been on their show. Um, and so we were just friends in that way. Uh, you know, didn't know, I don't know them, never met them in real life, uh, in person. Um, and then last November, Lance invited us all, including Ole and uh, Blair, uh, aka Illuminati, um, to the uh, uh, Lance's election night live stream during the midterms. And that's, uh, in fact, I think I missed when Illuminati and Olay was on, I think, even though they were on that same live stream. I just wasn't on at the same time as them. And people enjoyed all six of us so much that night that I think, I don't remember who thought of it. Maybe Lance? Let's, uh, let's, let's get all six of us back together for a regular sort of panel show. I think it came out of a conversation about how the right is so good at constantly cross-promoting each other's content. Uh, I mean, think about all the Ben Shapiro, Matt Walsh, uh, you know, those guys always get together and do stuff together. Um, so we were like, we should do the same at our, at our level. And that's sort of how it all came together. I, I think we do all mesh really well. Um So, yeah, thank you for asking. Uh, once again, if you can, if you're not already, patreon.com slash Matt Binder to support this show. Uh, your support would, would really be a big help. Uh, you know, we were getting so close to that goal, that that next step goal, I should say, because it's not the ultimate goal of 400 uh, patrons. And we, we fell a little bit behind, but we'll get back there, I'm sure, uh, if a bunch of you become patrons. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, if you can, if you can't, I'm not talking to you. Please don't feel that, uh, way at all. Uh, you could help by one-offs, and if you can't do that, you can help by just telling people about the show and continuing watching and interacting yourself, honestly. That's all, the most, I, that's, that's the major ask, honestly. Um, and now, uh, who should I rate on Twitch? Who should I raid on Twitch? Drew says Brandon Sutton and Emma would be good on the Leftist Mafia show. Yes. Um, I don't know if they would want to do it regularly. I mean, I remember RM Brown came on and he wanted to join us more regularly and then he hasn't since. I don't know if that's on us or if that was just because he couldn't. Um, but I'd love to have them on at the very least. Got to get them on. Absolutely.
Yeah, start start bar says what a backstory. LOL. Yeah, not not a not a lot of backstory there, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right, let me see who's on Twitch right now to raid. <laughs> Someone said Jason Society. I don't know if they're on because I follow them, I think. I don't see them on. Um... I don't know Alec Gunter, and that's a new person. Uh, thanks for the uh, recommendation. Um, I want to do someone completely new. I, li I like I like opening up the horizons on Twitch and and introducing my audience and myself to a whole new person uh, who I haven't um, rated before, and in, and in turn their audience discovers this show. So let's do that, Alec Gunter. Let's do that. Oh, and he's talking about uh, important stuff right now, uh, at least according to his stream title. I don't know if he's still on that topic. So let's do that. Alec Gunter it is. Let's raid this channel. All right, everyone. As always, an absolute pleasure to talk with you all. If I don't hear talk to you uh, soon, then... um. Oh, wait, he's rated me. Oh, Alec Gunther just rated me. That is hilarious. I was just... Hello, Alex uh, Twitch viewers. I was actually just going to raid him based on uh, what Omega said. I'm literally just <laughs> calling it a night on this stream. So if you're from Alex show... Go to youtube.com slash Matt Binder. Subscribe there. Follow the Twitch channel that you're watching right now. Catch up on the live stream episode that just aired if you'd like. It was a great episode, if I do say so myself. Great guest as well. Um, and uh, if you follow me, it's like you'll you'll be you'll be you'll you'll be raided into the episode and next time I stream. <laughs> Oh, man, that's too funny. I was literally just about to raid him. Guess I need to do another 30 minutes, says Lonzetta. I'm way too tired. I'm sorry. I Maybe if it was another night, I would do that. Um, I'm, I'm just shot right now, though. Uh, so let's raid... Who should I raid then? Who else should I raid? Let's see. Um, well, I'll raid. I'll return the favor next time to Alec, obviously. But I can't raid him now. All right. Uh, I'm looking who's on right now. I see uh, Gappy V. Uh, Hamozi Goat, Ariana Jasmine, Famous Horse. Um, that's not everyone. That's just who's showing up on my uh, thing. And I don't follow enough people on uh, on Twitch, so I, I need to follow more people. Who's Alex's friend? Alex said, says to raid... All right, that makes sense. I'll uh, raid B33. R. This is a this is a hard hard username to uh, <laughs> to do here. What are they doing right now? I always have to check in. 
I'd have to check in, see what's going on, what's being talked about. Playing some games. All right, let's let's surprise uh, as Alex friend. And a le- he's a lefty too. There's a lot of let's let's surprise him with this whole uh, with this uh, raid here. Let's do this. An unsuspecting the gaming ones are fun to raid because they're uns- they're playing their game. They don't they're not you know uh, focused on the stream and the chat. All right, here we go. All right, everybody. Now. I will see you all. Uh, enjoy WrestleMania. Uh, uh, have fun blocking all the Twitter blue paying subscribers when the verification badge is removed from the legacy verified users. Uh, <laughs> and I will see you all next time on Doomed. <laughs>